All right. Good morning, everyone. I would say that today is Tuesday, May 17th, but it's also election day, hence the vote necklace. Back on for election day. Yoo-hoo! Primary election. Everyone, please, please, please vote. Um, I have Commissioner Stegman here and Commissioner Jayapal is virtual this morning. Um, and here comes Commissioner Myron. This is our fourth budget work session. The health and safety of our community and staff members are at the forefront of our minds as we continue to navigate county business in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's meeting is a virtual, oops, hybrid board meeting, which means that some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those who are presenting virtually, please mute your mic when you're not speaking. And when you present, make sure to unmute your mic and turn your camera on. And with that, our first presentation today is from the Local Public Safety Coordinating Council, affectionately known as LIPSIC. Abby Stamp, take it away. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, although the Chair just stated it, my name is Abby Stamp. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Executive Director of the Multnomah County Local Public Safety Coordinating Council. And yes, you may call us LIPSIC often. All right. Um, or whatever, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> or as they say in Lane County, the PSCC. All right, down to business. Yeah, they take the local out. Anyway, <laughs> thanks, Deja. The first slide here, this is what we're going to cover in our brief time together this morning. Um, a bit about equity and how we're applying that internally and externally to our office, um, staffing a budget, any program changes in terms of successes and some what we're looking at, hopefully, for FY23, and some time to take your questions. Next slide. So with a very small non-D office, um, it's been really important to us to figure out how to incorporate equity using the equity and empowerment lens and also considerations for the workforce equity strategic plan. And thinking externally, uh, we do make sure that equity and racial justice are the lenses through which we do all of our work. And that is everything from prison reduction, which is um, uh, justice reinvestment, jail reduction and pretrial work, which is our safety and justice uh, challenge. The pretrial reform work funded by MacArthur, our transforming justice efforts, um, and also our exciting new partnership with the Office of Community Involvement. It's been fantastic to work with Danny, more about that in a moment. Um, but really, race is the forefront. I think that we ensure that reform happens with racial justice um, really at the forefront, thinking about all the other ways to measure equity and justice as well. But racial justice is really the key, particularly in this space. Um, also, uh, in the budget, you will see a new violence prevention coordinator. It's actually a project manager um, to help the intra county uh, coordination of violence, community violence reduction, and then possibly. Um, Interjurisdictional work as well, and we want to focus on communities that are most impacted by violence. Next slide. So, in terms of the WESP, um, with our team of five, um, and I think that's a good moment to just pause and remind just everybody that what I'm talking about today is the work that funds the local public safety coordinating council office, which is different than the local public safety coordinating council executive committee um, and work that happens on committee level. Um, and so a few of the highlights for our WESP work is that we did hire um, the Justice Fellowship Coordinator, Siamab Husseini, is new to the OCI office. And I just wanted to call that out because of our partnership together. Um, and what we're going to be doing in that world is using our MacArthur grant to both fund CMOB's position and also a contract with a community-based organization to really focus on equity and collaboration and power sharing between members of the community who will be our justice fellows and uh, local justice leadership to work together using data to co-create strategies that will impact and um, hopefully reduce in a meaningful way racial and ethnic disparities across the decision points in the criminal legal system. That work is very much in the um, zygote phase, but it is a, it is a thing and we're, we're moving forward with that. Um, I'm also talking about launching some racial reckoning events. I've been really proud of the work um, of the Transforming Justice Project and what that is very much focused on the doing and on the brain part of really reconstructing and reimagining a, a local justice system that is much more just, but it doesn't have a 
it's it's a warm fuzzy project, but it doesn't really have a lot of heart. And really talking about the why and really strumming those chords of emotion and really understanding how the system is not broken. It's doing exactly what it was built to do and understanding that history and the impact and the negative impact that we are experiencing today. So that work is um, very much in conversation with the square 1 folks at Columbia University have agreed to work with us and we're hoping to be able to have some some events around history and 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 coming together uh, before the end of the calendar year. Um, I have been working collaboratively with HR uh, to ensure that our hiring practices are very transparent and really tap into maybe a non-typical way of the way that government tends to do recruitment and uh, the partnership with um, Jenny and Anna has been fantastic with HR. Um, also through the years, we've been doing some um, collaboration with Office of, Di of, of Diversity and Equity just to really make sure that when I think about coaching and supporting and mentoring my staff, that we're doing it in a very thoughtful, leading with, ra leading with race way. And for someone who came up through real traditional clinical so social work supervision, I think that's really important for me to just take a pause and think differently about that. Next slide, please. So here we are. So before I very briefly go over our org chart, which is great, one slide you get everybody. Um, I just want to take a minute and say thank you to the amazing people I get to work with every day. Um, uh, we do a lot and we don't have a lot of power, but we have immense influence. And I just want to thank Sarah and David and Christina and Lily and CMOM for really um, leaning into that with grace and with dignity um, and really working together to have as much authority over change as we possibly can um, from that very informal, um, influential space. So anyway, uh, <laughs> that was unexpected. So um, as per usual, I've done a, a color coding example for you because it is that simple. So myself and Christina are funded through our 1145 pass-through dollars. That's sort of that reddish color. Sarah Mullen and David Mitnick in my office are funded through the Safety and Justice Challenge for Project Management and Data Analysis. But because a lot more money goes through the LIPSIC budget than the actual people, I wanted to highlight the three others through MacArthur that are funded through IT, Stuart and Damien, and then um, we already discussed um, Seema Husseini, who's working at OCI. Uh, and then Lili Yamamoto is our point eight project manager for justice reinvestment, and that's our green box. And um, actually tomorrow, I have my first meeting with HR to recruit and hire this uh, new violence prevention position, um, and that will be county general fund. And that is why the person's name is violence prevention, because we don't have a person in that yet. Next slide, please. Oh, that's not their name? No, it's not. Oh, okay. No. Um, vile, yeah. <laughs> so here's... Uh, the, the lovely pie chart of our work. Um, and it's when you look at it like this and you know, ask yourself a question, well, what are you doing? And just being incredibly transparent and proud to say we're in the decarceration business. Doing decarceration thoughtfully and carefully and safely is hard work, but that's really where most of our money um, goes to. In addition to collaboration and facilitating all of the work between the Lipsic Executive Committee partners. Um, in terms of policy implications, the implementation of transforming justice, yes, you, wow, um, could have some policy change implications through the next year or so, and all of that is still very much in flux, but we'll know a lot more in the next six to eight weeks. Um, and I just wanted to call out um, the internal services goes to IT for the administration of decision support system justice, the data warehouse. And the contract services looks really big um, because it does fund our victim services dollars through uh, the justice reinvestment grant, which is the 10% carve out from the state to ensure that we are funding um, local uh, provi service provision to victims of crime. Next slide. So the two new things um, before you today is a one-time only program offer um, to fund uh, through County General Fund, uh, $250,000 for continuing work on transforming justice and whether that's working with our existing contract or bringing in subject matter experts to help us get unstuck in some very stuck spaces. That is all to be determined as the work unfolds and the vision is complete. And as I mentioned, um, the new 1.0 FTE position that will be ongoing, um, a new position in the LIPSIC office, and that will be um, uh, ongoing funding through County General Fund. Next slide. So a few, oh, uh, a lot of successes. Uh, I, we do a lot of meetings, but I, I, 
it, really great ones and they're fun and they're uh, important and the work is important. So the transforming justice vision and we came and briefed uh, the board a couple of weeks ago will be complete around <laughs> June 30th. We're pushing hard to get that done. Um, we just have ongoing and critical monitoring of justice reinvestment and reevaluating that program all of the time to ensure it's still doing what it's intended to. Um, and making sure we're um, unpacking the impact on racial and ethnic disparities for folks who are either eligible or opt out of that program. And it also addressing the immense case backlog that has accumulated throughout the pandemic. Um, we are the applicant and administrator for several CJC grants. Um, Justice reinvestment is the big one. And then we support the courts in their specialty court application and monitoring. I'm pretty excited about our new justice fellowship project, uh, which CMOB is running. And we're in the middle of a procurement. Um, we're trying to get some applicants from the community to help build a curricula to um, educate and then partner with the to be determined and named uh, justice fellows. Ongoing management of the safety and justice challenge um, pretrial, as you may know, is a really big topic. Um, I think it's always a really big, important topic, but right now it's um, pretty visual in the community. Um, and I'm really excited about that. I'm really uh, proud of the work that um, my team has really leaned into to make sure that our pretrial justice system is just that, just, um, and that we are doing much better practice to um, uphold everybody's constitutional rights and keep the community safe. And I, we get a bunch of cold calls, all of us. Uh, we just are a national leader. It's really exciting. People want to know how to hold good meetings and how do you create and agitate change from space of informal leadership and that um, those relationships continue to blossom and stay maintained throughout our work together. Next slide. Is other policy issues and impacts just like always. We just are so dependent on the state budget process and what that will fund or what that will make us do to change. And that is because 1145 is passed through 3194 is also based on that same formula. In addition to supplemental and dealing with county state dynamics around those applications is always a challenge. We are on our final MacArthur grant after all these years. We are on the last opportunity. Um, it is a sustainability grant, so it's less than it has been. It's not $2 million, it's 1.16 something. Um, but that is MacArthur's effort to say, Multnomah County, great job, it's time to stop. Just do your work, implement it, and get it done. So we are leaning hard on all of the partners to get this pretrial work um, really completed. And then transforming justice. All to be determined, but really exciting. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities for not just budget and policy, but also legislative concepts and other changes that we're trying to better coordinate for change in the future. I think that's my last slide. Next one. Yep. There you have it. Questions, comments for Abby and lipstick. All right, Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Abby. Uh, I, um, you know, I'm, I was really, I'm really glad to hear about the partnership with the Office of Community Involvement as well. And um, I, I just had one a question about the violence prevention funding and how have we, and does this intend to coordinate with the city's Office of Violence Prevention? Mm -hmm. Good question. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, when we developed the position the first thought was, let's make sure within Multnomah County, we have a point of contact, that we have a local expert that anybody can go to and have deep understanding um, what the county funds, what the county does, and potential opportunities to fill gaps in the future. And I think once that work is nailed down, that absolutely the partnership with um, not just Portland, but all cities in Multnomah County is going to be absolutely critical. And I continue to meet with Mike Myers every Tuesday, actually, uh, in 10 minutes, if things or so, um, and uh, we've uh, talked about this opportunity and just making sure that that work is that that the coordination is coordinated um, between those roles as well. All right, no further questions. Thanks, Mr. Drybal. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Abby. Um, really excited about a couple of things: the Justice Fellowship a Coordinator and um, that Violence Prevention Coordinator. I think that's been. That's that's really an important function and appreciate the fact that we're starting with um, internal coordination and then. <coughs> excuse me, looking outward and um, 
Just one question, I think it's sort of a general question, not necessarily a budget question, but on the transforming justice um, work. So you're expecting the the vision to be completed in June of this year. And I'm wondering, you know, what's envisioned for FY23 with this budget allocation? What, what do you see the work as being for next year? I can, I will look into my crystal ball, um, but we'll also say that um, because the vision and the strategies have not been approved or voted on by our steering committee, it's it's a bit of conjecture. So, um, sorry, I, I, I'm looking straight at you, Commissioner, but all you can see is the back of my head, so I apologize. It's very odd. <laughs> Uh, the it is very odd. It's, odd from this, it's odd from this perspective as well. <laughs> I know I want to turn around and wave, but that would be even even um, less appropriate. Uh, so the the vision has um, six key themes, and you know they're beautiful, amazing themes. You know we envision a county that leads with leads with humanity. We envision a county that um, root causes are addressed outside the criminal justice system, and then there are eighteen accompanying core strategies, and those strategies are things like reimagining behavioral health. Um, uh, improve relationships between law enforcement and the communities they patrol, like really big, important strategies to help get to the vision. So there are 18 strategies. We have voted on eight. There are 10 left to ponder, and they may change. So by the time the vision and those strategies are voted upon and approved at the end of June, then next year or starting in the summer, we'll really look at What's already happening in our community? What are the strategies we want to prioritize? Um, for example, I continue to have offline conversations with partners like, like HealthShare, um, just to make sure that any of those health or Medicaid or macro system conversations are continuing to stay connected while these strategies are being queued up. And so I would love to come back to the commission and give a big presentation about all of the approved work, um, because the big work ahead of us is figuring out what are we going to prioritize and how is it all going to roll out. Great. Thank you, Abby. You're welcome. Mr. Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Abby. Uh, I'm really excited about the transforming justice work, and, and I know it's still in its uh, formation stages, but being part of, of that group. Uh, it's kind of like, and Commissioner Jayapal, I guess I could say, it's like wishing what we all could dream about our justice system would be and saying, if we could make anything happen and change anything, that's really kind of the aspirational goal. And it's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, so I'm super excited. I, I know that some, uh, this is really going to be the genesis of where we launch off to really start making real change significant change so i'm really excited about that uh, and then abby i did i did have some questions about the violence prevention coordinator uh, as you know my office has done a lot of work about the around the intersectionality of violence and so i uh, do you have a, a clear i know that you'll want to get that person stood up but i'm wondering like can you talk about like how we'll work across departments and divisions with this person I would imagine that this individual will take the same approach that all of my staff do, which is identifying all of the key partners and just being very relational and continuing to make sure that those networks and relationships are solid to understand what each department does, what each department is doing and what each department wants to do as it pertains to community violence, which is a lot of different types of violence. Um, but having one FTE, as you know, Commissioner, is going to be really great to have that point of contact. Um, and as always, just continuing to be transparent with the board, anybody who wants to really have an influence or a conversation about um, what's working well and what what needs some some support and some better communication and coordination. Yeah, it's going to be so wonderful just to have a point person uh, to really pull this all together. So I'm really happy about that as well. And that, but I am concerned. You mentioned that the 1145 money. This is the last year. Is, is that what you said? No, the safety and justice challenge. Oh, okay, good. Grant. Okay, yeah, good. That's all right. That's better. I was worried. No, that would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, very good. That's good news. All right. Thank you, Abby. Appreciate all your hard work and your team's work. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, still want you to get your meeting with my oh, He knows I'll be. Um, fine. It's fine. Uh, I just um, did have one question. We we're talking about those the core strategies and the themes and all of that. And um, one of the strategies talking about reimagining community behavioral health and wanting to. Um, 
under again it's uh understanding that intersection um because uh, having done that a lot of that work in transforming the behavioral health system and having the deep systems analysis and a lot of the same people that are involved in the transforming justice work how that will intersect to move forward mm -hmm. um just want to yeah is that going to be yes, part of it so we've got so the the, the core strategies are really really high level like rocket ship level not even thirty five thousand foot yeah. airplane level and reimagining behavioral health, it's really conceptual, all of the things we want, right? That folks will get all of the, the community-based treatment and services they need and not have to deal with jail and yes, all of the wonderful, wonderful goals that we have. Um, but that's what we have so far because what we wanna do is not um, put the cart before the horse and get too far into tactics until we understand, okay, th this is a strategy we need to better unpack and make sure those connections are happening once the work really starts. And so to not get too far ahead, but just acknowledging that a core strategy has to be doing something different around behavioral health. So that's why we've got Julie Dodge integrally involved and Ebony Clark and uh, James Schroeder and Maggie Bennington Davis and you know all of the, a lot of the key players in local behavioral health and medical systems to help make sure, and our relationship as well, Commissioner, that as the strategy becomes actual work, that we're able to um, build the, the work group stuff mm -hmm. together and and uh, capitalize on the work that's already happening that's great because we do we did go that step further and do have a lot of those building blocks in place and taking that aspirational vision and and putting that's operationalizing great. so definitely look forward to that great thanks savvy you're welcome have a wonderful day Thank and you. as you're transitioning out we will call up our next team which is Department of Community Justice. Come on down, Erica Pruitt. And Jay. Good morning. Good morning. So good morning, Chair Kafori and our Board of County Commissioners. Um, we are here today to present our fiscal year 2023 budget. With me today is Jay Scroggin, our Adult Services Division Division Director, and Dina Corso, our Juvenile Services Division Director. And I must note that this will be Dina's last time to present the juvenile budget. And I just want to acknowledge her leadership and amazing influence on our community in her tenure as the Juvenile Services Division Director. So this is our plan for our presentation. Next, next slide, please. Um, before we begin, I do want to thank our budget advisory committee members for their contributions to our budget processes. Their names are listed on the slide. Can we go to the next slide? They're Robbie Davis, Rebecca Fisher, Lisa Freeman, Aaron Klein, and Nama Schwartz. We meet with them throughout the year and want to thank them for their commitment and learning about the work that we do. Rebecca Fisher and Aaron Klein are joining us virtually to present their recommendations. And now I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca and Aaron. Good morning. Good morning. Just pulling up my notes. Eric Fori and members of the Multnomah County Commission. My name is Aaron Klein. I use he him pronouns. And I am the chair of the DCJC back and appreciate the opportunity to share the recommendations of our committee with you today. Um, Rebecca uh, won't be joining us this morning, and just want to uh, uh, one of the names of one of our members, Nama Schweitzer. Just want to correct that for the record. Um, next slide, right. please. Erin, can you pause for just a second? It's your audio is a little it's off, so it's yeah. kind of hard to understand uh, it. Let me see, Tasia, is there something we can do on our end? Uh, 
Aaron, do you have headphones maybe that you can use? I do. I'll put you on mute and I'll be right back. Thank you. Musical interlude. And how is that? Good morning. Yep, much better. Thank you, Aaron. Right, so I'll uh, begin again. Uh, Chair Kafori and members of the Multnomah County Commission, my name is Aaron Klein. I use he him pronouns. I'm the chair of the DCJC back and appreciate the opportunity to share the recommendations of our committee with you today. Um, just uh, Rebecca won't be joining us this morning and just want to correct for the record Nama Schweitzer's name who's a member of our committee. Um, like the uh, county commissioners, the DCJC back is committed to a safe county for all our residents that supports people being on the path to leading their best lives. We believe that culturally specific community based programs and victim services are critical to that path. With the unique opportunity presented by a 0% budget constraint and a decreasing supervision population, we urge county leadership to prioritize these services that promote true community safety rather than inflating the funding of supervision programs. Our communities are facing an increase in violence and our region is in pain. Uh, we have all seen how this pain has been weaponized by political opportunists and some law enforcement leaders who have suggested that increases in violence and homelessness are the result of recently approved and widely supportive transformative policies that reduce the punishment of people that reduce the punishment of people that are suffering and limit law enforcement contacts to relics of our state's racist history. Uh, while the causes of crime are complex, the systemic underinvestment and neglect of our communities has been laid bare during the on ongoing pandemic and racial justice protests. Every dollar spent on supervision, jail, and other systems of control is a dollar not invested in housing, education, health, and employment which are the factors that sustain community safety and prosperity. This moment demands a transformative budget with significant investments in culturally specific community-based resources and crime victim services. These programs serve the communities most impacted by crime and those harmed both, his both historically and in the present day by the public safety systems of this region. Our recommendations are very similar to the recommendations that we shared for FY 2020, 2022. We urge county leadership to consider the decline in the supervision population and reallocate funding from supervision related services toward victim services and culturally specific community based violence prevention programs, which are underfunded yet serve an increasing number of people. And uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. And the next one, I'm having difficulty seeing the slides at the same time as I'm reading. Um, the slide uh, this, is the adult supervision population. This is great, thank you. Um, this slide shows the nearly one third decline of the supervision population over the past seven years. I'll also highlight that last year, the CBAC noted that the department's forecast of the supervision population for FY22 was inflated. The approved budget forecasted an adult supervision population of 10,000, even though state trends showed that it would be lower. At the time, we suggested that the population would be 9,200, and this year's budget uh, estimates that the final FY22 population will be 9,000 and forecasts a similar population in FY23. The CBAC urges the county to reallocate resources from supervision toward victim and survivor services culturally specific services within the Department of Community Justice and restorative practices for youth. Our specific recommendations are as followed in, in priority order. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, offer uh, 5003, victim and survivor services. Um, in contrast to the supervision population, uh, crime victim and survivor services are effectively serving an increasing population. This is life-saving work and helps to prevent future community violence. Yet this critical work remains underfunded. Underfunding this department, this, this program area, 
prevents it from offering culturally specific services to a broader range of our community's population. We know that true community safety depends on serving all victims of crime, including those who are historically underserved, including young men and black indigenous and other people of color. Uh, moving on to offer 50035, flip the script. Like the Victim Services Unit, culturally specific community programs, including Flip the Script, are serving more people more effectively. Yet they are seeing a decline in funding. The Flip the Script program, for example, is estimated to have served more than three times the number of people anticipated in FY22 and is anticipated to have led to job placements for 10% more individuals than were anticipated. However, they are uh, facing a 2% cut in their funding. And uh, offer 50050B, uh, juvenile training and restorative practices. We support any furthering of restorative justice philosophy and practices in the department's work. Restorative practices must center people who have been harmed by interpersonal violence and by systemic violence and racism. Offer 50050B will expand restorative practices in juvenile detention facilities. We would like to see even greater investment in the expansion of restorative justice programs philosophy and practices, which will better serve both survivors of violence and people who have caused harm. I'd also like to note that uh, our written report noted 50032 be an error, uh, which was a program offer from an earlier year. Um, we urge you to prioritize elements of the budget that will create sustainable community safety, reduce harm caused to marginalized community, and uphold the values of our communities. Thank you for your attention, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Aaron, and thank you to the rest of your team. Please express our appreciation for the work that you do. I know it's um, a lot of work and you spend all year learning the very complex uh, budget of the Department of Community Justice, and we all very much appreciate you and your team. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and um, I would like to say that we as DCJ appreciate the CBAC's partnership um, in this work and um, the insights and the perspectives that you give us. So thank you very much. Um, before I get started, I'd be remiss if I did not um, just uh, acknowledge that it really does take a team to do this budget. And in uh, this um, space with us is uh, Catherine Sofich and Jalise Jones. Catherine Sofich is our community and policy Policy and Communications Manager, and Jalise Jones is our Finance Manager. And um, as we go through this, um, this presentation, Jalise is here also to be um, a, a lifeline to us if there's any questions later on. Um, and so with that, I'm going to get started to our, our next slide. I wanted to provide an overview of our budget process. We continue to engage in a collaborative process that informs our budget development. We engage in a departmental budget group of 38 staff across classifications who provide input and recommendations on reductions and additions. Relevant staff feedback is gathered by online anonymous form and is consistently shared with division budget teams. We are informed by our conversations with our community budget advisory committee and our decisions are guided by criteria and values. Divisions were directed to consider the following criteria when developing recommendations. First, serving the highest risk populations, investing in programs and services that improve community safety by helping justice involved individual, in, involved youth and adults change their behavior, basing decisions on outcomes and evidence-based practices. Our final proposal was informed by discussions with division budget teams and the re recommendations of the senior leadership team. Our executive team used the following values to decide what proposals to move forward. And they were inclusively leading with race, safety, resource management, and trauma-informed practices. Next slide, please. The following outlines how we have integrated equity into our budget process. We use department wide equity questions. Each division discusses both the operational impacts as well as the equity impacts, utilizing an equity lens um, of their recommendations at the beginning of the process and continues throughout. Our equity and inclusion manager, Kalisha Stout, who is in this room, 
has provided valuable um, insights and intended as many division budget meetings as possible to provide input and serve as a resource. In addition, our equity and inclusion manager is a member of our executive team. This addition helps to ensure that the budget decisions and discussions that take place within the executive team lead with race and incorporate diversity and equity. The top value the executive team used to guide our proposal development was inclusively leading with race. We are committed to strengthening the ways in which we integrate equity into our decision making. Next slide, please. We have been able to make some progress on the implementation of our workforce equity strategic plan. Some highlights are each member of our senior leadership team is responsible for at least one goal, and we carve out time at our monthly meetings to discuss progress and barriers. Our WESP advisory committee has been meeting since March of 2020. This committee is a cross section of staff and managers who advise and hold accountable the progress and implementation of our WESP goals. Example of some of our completed items are funding six college to county interns. Our FY22 budget ensured we allocated funding for two college to county interns for each division. We worked with organizational learning to, to provide coaching and to support managers and offered coaching circles last year and have launched a new manager training this spring and summer. Research, um, we researched and implemented state interviews. Rather than only talking to our staff when they leave, we will begin conducting, conducting stay interviews beginning in June. Looking ahead, this budget is proposing project management support to provide guidance to align work, provide data analysis, and measure outcomes. The West subgroups will finalize recommendations and present them to the advisory committee. Next slide, please. Our organizational chart shows our proposed budget and staffing. Please note that in our published offer, program offer 5003 showed up under the adult services budget and it should be in the director's office. This means that the numbers on this chart are different from what was published in the shares proposed budget. This will be corrected prior to budget adoption. Next slide, please. This slide shows an overall picture by fund comparing our adopted FY 20, 2022 budget to our FY 2023 proposed budget. The chart illustrates that we get the majority of our funding through general fund followed by state funding. Our FY 2023 budget will increase by $11.9 million overall. 8.4 million is a general fund increase and 3.5 million is state fund increase. We are happy to be here today presenting a budget that includes an increase. As will be outlined in this presentation, this increase is allowing us to stabilize our staffing, build back some capacity that has been reduced over the last several years of reductions, make important investments in our facilities and sustain programming that is addressing community violence and delivering culturally specific services. Next slide, please. This slide is showing DCJ's budget over a five year trend. As you can see, we have been experiencing pretty steady county general fund dollars with a bigger increase being proposed for this upcoming budget. At the state level, we have been experiencing decreased levels of funding, including a noticeable decrease in FY 2022. This was due to the current service level budget not accounting for rising personnel costs and other inflation. The increased cost and time it now takes to supervise justice-involved individuals, felony population decrease, and reduction in justice reinvestment funding. A portion of this funding was restored in 2021 state legis legislative session, which is reflective in our FY23 um, proposed budget. Next slide, please. This slide is showing FTE trends over the past five years. 
We have experienced a decrease of 39 FTE since FY 2000, 2019. Some of this is reflective of the series of state budget reductions, especially in FY 2020, when we had to do a mid-year rebalance that I referenced in the last slide. This also includes ASD experiencing a decrease in felony population over the last several years, which has also impacted staffing levels and workload. It is important to note that this proposed budget is reflecting an increase in FTE. A stronger than expected economy resulted in a restoration of state dollars of community corrections funding during the 2021-23 legislative session. This led to adding back some positions that were eliminated in 2020. The state funds JSD received the state funds JSD received remained at current service level and actually resulted in a slight increase, which resulted in being able to fund two positions, programming and enhancements to the decision facility and direct client assistance. Next slide, please. As you can see from the chart, personnel is our largest cost. There was no significant change in the breakdown of where we spent our money in FY 2022. Next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about our budgets by division. Next slide, please. This slide shows the breakdown of our budget by division. 17% of DCJ's budget is in the director's office, primarily the general fund with a small amount of grant funding. It includes administration, internal service costs, and the victim survivor services unit. 54% of DCJ's budget is in the adult services division. About 64% is general fund. The rest of their funding is funding from other sources, mostly state funding. 29% of DCJ's budget is in the Juvenile Services Division, about 81% general fund. The rest of their funding is from other sources, mostly state funding. This budget looks like the percentage uh, general fund dollars increased a bit compared to last year. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the director's office. And we're going to provide you an overview of trends and provide highlights of the budget proposals in each division. We'll begin with the director's office. The director's office includes human resources, business services, research and planning, business applications and technology, victim and survivor services, and the equity and inclusion manager. Next slide, please. We wanna talk a little bit about victim and survivor services trend, trends. This slide is providing some data for our victim and survivor services unit. Over the past several years, we have been collecting data in new ways to more meaningfully reflect the work that we do. This includes capturing the work that is being done in the adult and juvenile divisions. Before we were only able to show data reflecting work being done in the adult division. The table on this slide represents this new data. We are still working to consistently track this data, so you will see a couple of places where we're not able to provide data for a specific year. The first column is tracking the initial contacts. This is tracking the number of letters sent to victims and survivors connected to DCJ, adult and juvenile, to notify them of their rights share how they can opt in, and explain resources available to them. In FY21, we began sending letters to all victim survivors connected to DCJ for the first time. A letter is sent to a victim or survivor as soon as a JII or youth is on supervision within DCJ. FY2021 shows a decrease in initial contacts, which reflects the decrease in the number of people DCJ is supervising. The second column is the total number of victims who have requested notification-based rights. When a victim requests notification, it is the victim survivor services job to notify them in order to meet our statutory obligation to uphold victims' rights. This number continues to increase and impacts the workload of the unit. 
We are working to address the workload issue. In FY 2022, we used American Rescue Plan dollars to fund a records technician. The chair is proposing that this position be funded with ongoing dollars in FY 2023, which will mean the support can continue beyond American Rescue Plan funding. The third column shows the average number of victims we serve through advocacy each month. Our advocates provide system information and navigation, emotional support, trauma education, safety planning, probation parole officer consultations, crisis response, housing support, and court accompaniment. As you can see, the monthly average victim served um, more than doubled in the last fiscal year. Again, this is an area where we need to continue to track workload. In FY21, we created two culturally specific advocate positions to better serve our Black and African American and Latino, Latina, and Latinx community, communities. We will continue to work with the Victim Survivor Services to identify staffing needs and other resources they need to navigate the increased need victims and survivors are experiencing. In addition to providing notifications and advocacy, we also have a Victim Survivor Services Fund to provide temporary emergency assistance to victims and survivors that have been harmed by a justice-involved individual on supervision within DCJ. We have also received COVID-19-related funding to support survivors as well as, as, as a result of the impact of the pandemic on increasing rates of domestic violence and gun violence and the increase in lethality risk and risk to survivor safety. We're requesting funds again in FY 2023, which will provide assistance to people experiencing all crime types. Next slide, please. Highlights of budget decisions in the director's office include overall DCJ budget increased by 743,000, other funds decreased by 72,000. The general fund increased by 800,000. A portion of this increase is due to the conversion of some American Rescue Plan dollars into ongoing county general fund. New positions were added, which will be outlined in the next slides. The position we added both add back, reduce staffing and new capacity as we engage in reform efforts and transform as a department. As mentioned before, prior years led to reductions and we are now in a place where we can begin building back in the interest of maintaining our commitment to evidence-based practices, equity and inclusion. Next slide, please. The next slide talks about significant program changes and will outline several positions and capacity that we are proposing to add to the director's office. The first is a project manager. Due to several years of budget reductions, the department's project management capacity has greatly reduced. This position will rebuild our capacity. The work of this position will support and initiate department-wide initiatives rooted in the workforce equity strategic plan and use change management strategies to ensure the department is successfully structuring and implementing complex multifaceted initiatives and projects. Next is a records technician with our victim and survivor services unit. This is one of the positions that was funded with American Rescue Plan dollars last year and is being proposed to receive ongoing general funds. I did want to point out that this program offer includes positions and programming that are housed both in the director's office and in our adult services division. Program offer um, 542. So you will also see additional information in our overview of the adult services division budget. The work of our victim and survivor services unit has increased over the last several years and adding um, positional, additional positions is much needed. This specific, position, this specific position is responsible for informing victim survivors of crime about their rights, 
and notifying victims and survivors of hearings related to their crime victims' rights. Next slide, please. This slide also lists two other items that were funded with American Rescue Plan dollars last year and are being proposed to receive ongoing general funds. The first is a project manager tasked with tracking the programs and contracts funded with American Rescue Plan dollars. This position will also be able to provide ongoing assistance on other projects, including future of work, reform efforts, enhanced collaborations to reduce gun violence, among other projects. The second is dollars for consultation as we adapt our evidence based practices to address new needs in our communities as we continue to uh, navigate the pandemic and engage in reform. Trauma informed and restorative practices to inform intervention strategies in our in community violence. Now, I'd like to turn it over to our juvenile services division director, Dana Corso. Good morning, Chair Corey and commissioners. For the record, my name is Dina Corso. I'm the Juvenile Services Division Director for the Department of Community Justice. The Juvenile Services Division, or JSD, uses a family-focused and positive youth development approach to hold justice-involved youth accountable, provide restorative and reformation opportunities, and promote, oh, we need to go to the next slide, sorry, and promote equitable and fair approaches to public safety. JSD is responsible for delinquency prevention and early intervention, informal supervision, formal probation supervision, accountability, community engagement, detention alternatives, including a residential assessment and evaluation program, and detention services. Next slide, please. This slide shows the gender, race, and ethnicity of youth who received formal or informal supervision or diversion services in fiscal year 2021. In addition to supervision, youth and families served by JSD receive a variety of supports tailored to meet their individual and unique needs. Some of the services provided include family-centered case planning, connection to education, job readiness, and community treatment providers, culturally specific family-focused wraparound services and mentoring, accountability opportunities to assist youth in repairing the harm they have caused in the community, detention alternatives, including shelter and a residential assessment evaluation program, and detention services for youth awaiting trial who cannot safely reside in the community. The percentages highlight the continued challenge of overrepresentation of youth of color. Race equity is a major focus for the Juvenile Services Division. Like many jurisdictions around the nation, we have been very successful at reducing the overall number of youth of color impacted by the juvenile justice system but significant disparities continue to exist. We collaborate with our system partners and key stakeholders to be intentional about understanding and identifying the drivers of racial inequities and systemic racism that include institutional inequities, policies and practices, as well as implicit and explicit bias. We have strategically and intentionally expanded opportunities to include justice-involved youth and families as well as culturally specific community members in our efforts to dismantle practices that perpetuate inequities. Next slide, please. This slide shows where the youth who were on active supervision as of May 1st of 2022 live by neighborhood. It represents youth's home address, not the location where the delinquent activity occurred. The darker areas represent neighborhoods where greater numbers of justice-involved youth live, the highest concentrations are in the East County and Gresham area, as well as North Portland. Next slide, please. The top blue line on this slide shows the percentage of youth successfully completing the community monitoring program. This program is an alternative to placement and detention for youth who are awaiting a court hearing, and it has consistently demonstrated extremely positive outcomes. In 2021, 98% of youth released on community monitoring showed up to court. This program is run by one of our partners, Volunteers of America. The middle green line shows the percentage of restitution condition conditions that were completed. In 2021, 89% of closed cases that had restitution ordered by the court or by the juvenile department completed their restitution obligation. 93.5% of the dollars ordered were collected with the other 6.5% converted to a civil judgment. 
Many youth are able to earn money for restitution through JSD's Project Payback program. This program was suspended for a period of time due to COVID-19, but we made it a priority to bring it back as soon as it was safe to do so. The bottom orange line shows the recidivism rate for Multnomah County youth. In fiscal year 2021, we did see a rise in our recidivism rate. A few factors have likely contributed to this rise. First, over the past two years, we've seen a sharp decline in referrals for lower level offenses. As a result, most of the youth served by JSD during that time period have been at higher risk and adjudicated for more serious offenses than in the past. In calendar year 2019, 44% of criminal referrals were for felonies. That percentage increased to 56% and 53% in 2020 and 2021, respectively. Second, Senate Bill 1008 was implemented in January of 2020, and we are now serving youth on juvenile probation who would have, who would have previously been served on adult supervision or incarcerated. Since January 1st of 2020, JSD has received 261 referrals for 208 unique youth who prior to the implementation of Senate Bill 1008 would have gone to the adult system. Of those 208 youth, only three have had their cases disposed of as adults. 73 referrals resulted in youth being placed on juvenile supervision, all for serious felony offenses. Finally, the impact of the pandemic on youth and families cannot be underestimated. Disconnection from school, community providers, social supports, and much needed services combined with the uptick in community violence has certainly played a role. Next slide, please. Highlights of the proposed JSD division budget are uh, an overall budget increase of $4.6 million, a general fund increased by $4.0 million, and uh, this includes $3.2 million in one-time only funds. This funding would allow for investments in our detention facility, which I will talk about on the next slide. Other funds increased by 605,000. This is increase is the result of the second half biennium split, which yields a 2% revenue increase over last year. Next slide, please. This slide outlines some investments we are proposing for the Juvenile Services Division. We are asking for $3.2 million of one-time only funding in order to improve the safety and the environment of the Juvenile Detention Center. This building is 27 years old and in disrepair. This investment will fund the restoration of two pods and enhance the environment to become more trauma-informed and developmentally appropriate. While we are committed to improving the physical space for the youth who are housed in detention, we are also committed to improving other conditions of confinement. This includes funding that will allow us to integrate restorative practices that build and repair relationships and de-emphasize punitive discipline in favor of communication to resolve conflict. The use of restorative practices is expected to improve the overall safety of the facility, as well as reduce the use of punitive interventions such as room confinement. This will include a position to coordinate the implementation and ongoing utilization of restorative practices and a contract dedicated to training and consulting staff and managers and assisting in the development of a restorative practices implementation plan. Lastly, Senate Bill 575 passed in the 2021 legislative session and provided automatic expunction for youth who reached the age of 18 and have never been adjudicated. Funding was provided uh, to county juvenile departments to absorb the administrative costs associated with the expunction process. This amounted to $155,232 for fiscal year 2023. I would now like to turn it over to Jay Scroggin. Good morning, <coughs> excuse me. Good morning, Chair Kafori, Board of County Commissioners. I'm, for the record, I'm Jay Scroggin. I am the Adult Services Division Director. I use he, him, his pronouns. The Adult Services Division provides uh, supervision of approximately 9,000 justice-involved adults in the community annually. ASD includes the Recognizance Unit, or RECOG, Pretrial Services Program, and uh, that unit that both perform functions necessary for public safety and the effective operation of the local justice system. ASD also runs a community service program that provides alternatives to jail. Next slide, please. Similar to Dina's slide on juvenile, this pie chart shows the breakdown of demographics in the adult system. 
Like the demographic breakdown for youth, these numbers show a continued challenge in our system of an over of a over representation of people of color being supervised. I think it's important to note too in this slide when you look at the very very top and you see that the all adults serve 8,226. I just had a previous slide where I said that our population is 9,000, as did CBAC. This slide here gives us demographics, which comes from a state system. We actually do have another 700 or so people on monitored misdemeanor Dewey probation. They're on a different database and we don't have that kind of demographic data. So the numbers are correct. We do supervise 9,000 annually. On this slide though, we can only give you the demographics of about 8,200. Next slide. This slide shows the uh, GIS map that creates a a visual of the concentration of justice involved individuals. The legend is light to dark with the darkest areas representing the largest concentration of JII locations. You will see that the highest concentration comes from downtown Portland, East County, and Gresham. Next slide, please. So this slide shows three different lines. Uh, the top line is probations. These are people sentenced by the court to supervision. The middle line, the blue line, are people on post-prison supervision or parole, same kind of concept. But these are people whose sentence was to prison and they are being released to us. The bottom line shows our, our jail trend. This is, this is anyone who's in the, in the uh, Multnomah County Jail, it will show if they're assigned to us for any reason, sanction, revocation, this shows that population. I'd like to start with the top line. That's clearly the one that uh, sticks out here. Um, as you can see, we have a dramatic decrease uh, since uh, 2020. Um, largely, this is because of the impacts of COVID-19, the backup in our both our, our court and our criminal justice systems. Also, two years ago, we passed ballot measure 110, uh, the decriminalization of small amounts of uh, controlled substances. So those have that impact on that system. You see the post-prison line basically staying the same. In theory, these are people who were sentenced three years ago. Prior to the pandemic, they're still serving their prison time. Their release dates are still kind of a natural scheduled uh, occurrence, which is why that line has stayed basically the same. Um, I want to point out too, lastly, on our, I'm going to get to the jail side uh, the jail line last. Looking at though the decrease in our overall census, we believe uh, that um, it is still Im important to maintain our service level for several reasons. Um, we've had several years where that we've had to make sig significant reductions to our budget, leading to reductions in, in FTE. I think Erica had a slide showing the the drop in FTE in a state rebalance four years ago. In the recent state rebalance, restoring some funding, we are now at a place that we can maintain staffing to our caseload sizes of between 35 to 50 JIIs. That caseload size allows us, uh, our practitioners and the, the staff that, that support our practitioners to do our case management system. This includes developing case plans to help, uh, to help address the needs of JIIs, having time to develop relationships, build trust, and having time to develop relationships with our community providers who provide treatment to culturally specific services. Um, lastly, this phenomenon about, about us having the uh, ability budget-wise to, to maintain our funding, we get to ad address some of the more needed areas right now. We can focus services on our gang and our caseloads in, in involving gun violence. We can also focus maintaining our services in our domestic violence. Both of those areas have not seen a huge reduction because of COVID-19. Uh, lastly, that, that line there at the end, you see that our jail uh, usage has dropped by 50% since the pan pandemic. I would like to point out that I don't believe that that's just because of the pan pandemic. The Board of Commissioners a couple of years ago invested in us having a um, a, uh, a uh, notice of rights PO. This is someone who can fast track the people who get de detained, making our, our sanctions go from a larger portion of days to a much smaller, swift and certain. Um, that's an evidence-based practices. That, uh, that in uh, addition to focusing on using jail for immediate public safety risk is why you're seeing the number that it is up there. And we'd like to maintain that regardless of where we're at with the pandemic.
Next slide, please. This is our budget chart. O overall, we have an increase in ASD of 6.4 million. Uh, 3.6 million of, of that comes from county general fund. The, the re remaining 2.9 million comes from uh, state funding. Um, this increase is a, a result of the budget that was passed in the 2021 legislative session. This is our Senate Bill 1145 funding. The chair's proposal budget is provided ongoing funding for some of the community violence programs that we funded with ARPA, with ARP dollars last fiscal year. I will cover more specific in a few more slides. Overall, this increased funding is allowing us to restore capacity we have lost due to past budget cuts and add new capacity. Next slide, please. So some of the programs that we are wanting to make some significant program changes to and add. First thing is we'd like to add a senior manager. Um, we've we historically had five. I think there was even a period many, many, many years ago that there may have even been more of that. But for my career here, we've always had five that has been reduced to a three over the last uh, 10 or so years. Um, adding a senior brings us to the capacity of staff ratio that that we can we can focus on proper management of our of our teams and some of the projects as we move forward. The second item is an East Campus security presence. We contract with a uh, same company that works with um, a lot of county buildings. Our East Campus is big, and uh, this adds a second person. Currently, we, we only have funding for someone on the inside. This provides a presence on the inside and on the outside. That building has experienced some problems on the outside of the campus, both with vandalism and damage. And um, so uh, that presence makes our staff feel both both safe and it uh, maintains a uh, presence of safety there on that. Uh, lastly, uh, the third bullet there, we were asking for one time only funding to support a mental health treatment readiness program. And this program uh, will fund three corrections counselors and three community health workers. Basically, they will work to enhance motivation for treatment, stabilization, skill development, and case management services of our JIIs with a mental health unit. They will focus on individuals who are not ready to engage in mental health treatment or who are, or, or who are waiting to enter mental health treatment. This unit's outreach work has uncovered this need, and our goal of this pilot is to connect JIIs more quickly with the treatment and care they need and, uh, and reduce jail utilization. Currently, when you leave court or leave jail or leave prison, there could be a wait list, there could be problems. It could be a time before we can get them in to the treatment that they need. This provides a alternative wall to stop people from decomposing more, getting them these services. They can come in daily, check in, get a litany of services there. And so this is a this is a one time only pilot. We're going to see how this how this goes, but it's critical now because right now the only way to stabilize a lot of these folks, unfortunately, is is jail. Next slide, please. This slide is listing the number of programs and positions focused on addressing community violence that were funded in 2022 with ARP dollars and are now being proposed to be funded with ongoing dollars that which will allow us to sustain the work that 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 began. The first one is money to continue to continue our cultural specific programming that includes services to 18 to 30 year old young men in the Latinx communities. Services in include peer support, skill building, cognitive services, and behavioral cultural responsive services. The intent is to provide community support and resources to Latinx communities for those impacted by community violence. We are literally about two weeks away from establishing our, our caseload on that program with our pro provider. We're very, very excited about where this has gone. The second is continuing our expansion of our Habilitation Empowerment Accountability Therapy or HEAT program. This is our culturally responsive cognitive behavioral intervention program designed to reflect and address the unique experiences and needs of participants. The last item is maintaining three uh, full-time em employee community health specialist positions. These are placed in the Women and Family Services Unit in collaboration 
with County Health Department and DCHS to provide uh, families with safety plans and trauma support for those who have felt the direct impact of gun violence. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Erica. Next slide, please. Now we're going to be talking about our summary and our impacts. Next slide, please. The slide is showing a list of our new and one time only general fund requests that were covered in previous slides. Next slide, please. This slide is outlining two reallocation requests. The first is five full time juvenile custody service specialist positions. They will serve as floater positions to allow us to fill anticipated planned vacant shifts, thereby freeing up on call resource to utilize for vacancies that are unplanned. These positions are being funded by reallocating overtime funds and temp funds. Next is adding a human resource analyst who can focus on recruitment and onboarding of new staff. We currently have one permanent recruiter and are over capacity on our recruitments. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna talk about potential state impacts and D Dina and Jay will share this and I'll pass it over to Jay. Just wanna talk about two work groups that are going on at the state level. The first is the 1145 work group. 1145 is going on 27 years old. And so it was developed at a time where everyone kind of looked the same in the state and they gave it to the counties. So there was some real benefits there, but as we've progressed, counties are doing different things based on the needs of their individual counties. And so there's a real intentionality here to dissect 1145. Is it working? Is it not? And do we need a new funding mechanism moving forward if we're still going to maintain the concept of local control, which I would urge that we do. The next is a 1510 work group. When, when uh, Senate Bill 1510 passed, not only did it have impacts on our conditions of supervision, the very last part of community corrections was that the Department of Corrections was to establish a work group that uh, that called out and which would draft rule as to how we supervise. This talks about caseload size. This talks about, or I mean, this talks about, about contact standards. This talks about where we should and 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 how we see justice involved individuals in their home, in the office, in the community. And so that's going to be a mix of, of both community lived experience, victim community uh, participants, along with people within the criminal justice system. That is going to be starting here the next month. Um, we are hoping to get a Multnomah County presence on that work group with the state. Dina. The juvenile detention education programs or JDEP programs in Oregon have historically been underfunded, and that is particularly true for our detention facility since, since it is by far the largest in the state. A short term legislative fix was approved during the 2021 legislative session with an expressed expectation that a longer term solution would be developed by a legislative work group and presented to the 2023 legislature. Multnomah County is well represented in that work group and actively advocating for the educational needs of youth in our juvenile detention facility. Next slide, please. This slide is outlining how we have responded during the COVID-19 pandemic. Operational updates. All buildings have reopened. All in-person contacts have resumed for those delivering direct services. Last year, we received around 2.4 million in American Rescue Plan dollars. Funding has been provided for rent assistance, transportation services, client assistance, community violence staffing and programming, additional cleaning in several DCJ buildings. Next slide, please. In FY 2023, DCJ will be receiving about 1.3 million of American Rescue Plan funding. This is less than what we received in FY 2022, which can be shown in this slide. As noted before, funds for some of the programming and positions focusing on community violence prevention that were funded by American Rescue Plan in FY 2022 are being proposed to be funded with ongoing county general funds. Much of what is being funded is continuing work we began in FY 2022. 
highlights of what this fund, um, what this will fund are rent assistance and transitional housing for adults under supervision, line assistance to support people in several units. The Women and Family Services Unit is using the funding to assist families with childcare, educational assistance, and emergency assistance to approximately 300 um, current DCJ women and their families. The Mental Health Unit will be using this funding to continue and expand their outreach work to deliver basic supplies to DCJ supervised and non DCJ individuals, such as blankets, socks, hygiene items, etc. The victim and survivor services will continue to provide temporary emergency assistance to victims and survivors through direct support related to survivor safety of and the safety of their children and or provides support to survivors directly related to the impact of a crime or circumstance of a crime. Continued funding for a pilot project that will provide gun violence intervention programming and support the development and capacity growth of smaller community organizations and partners to expand the outreach and efficacy of gun violence intervention programs. Work has begun to establish this program and this funding will allow for the work to continue. This proposal is also funding a new community violence interruption pilot that will establish a pilot project that will leverage the existing incubator pro program and seek to use lived experience and expertise of the habilitation empowerment therapy, therapy accountability program heat those graduates by incentivizing participation in community violence interruption programs. Next slide, please. Deep breath. Questions. <laughs> that was that wasn't very much. So I'm sure there won't be any questions. <laughs> you all, and thank you, Dina. Congratulations on your impending retirement, and thank you for all your service to Multnomah County. And thanks for a great presentation this morning. Uh, we will start this time with Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Erica and Jay and, and Dina. I didn't know you were leaving. Well, congratulations. You will be greatly missed. And thank you for all your contributions. Uh, I don't really have a lot of questions. It's just uh, kind of a sigh of relief to see some more resources uh, going back uh, into DCJ. So I am really happy about that. I think probably the thing that most struck me that I think we all know is the concentration of lack of opportunities for youth and adults that are concentrated in East County. And uh, I find it so frustrating. Sometimes I feel like, you know, if it's not happening in Portland, uh, the rest of the county sometimes is just not paid as much attention to. And so clearly the maps that you have shown that there is a huge, huge need in East County. So I appreciate you highlighting that and also the racial disparities. Uh, and, you know, the restorative practices, I love that. I mean, that's that's the path that we need to go. And when Abby was up here talking about transforming justice, uh, and I know that you all are very, are very aligned with that work as well. I, I guess I did have one question. I, it was mentioned on the, I think for youth, the automatic expungement. Do we know what, uh, what types of uh, offenses are allowable to be expunged for those youth? So, um... The legislation was specifically about automatic expunction. Uh, there's a whole bunch of expunction eligibility that is not automatic uh, after five years have passed and good behavior and all that. But the, the legislation was specifically focused on youth who could have their, their records automatically expunged and in fact uh, created the responsibility for the juvenile departments to initiate that. Prior, it was up to the youth or young adult to come in and ask for their record to be expunged. Now the juvenile departments are compelled to automatically expunge the records of youth who are eligible. Basically, it's any youth who reaches the age of 18 and is, has, has no adjudications or has nothing pending uh, or adult convictions under Measure 11. So uh, if you made it to 18 without being adjudicated, your record gets to be expunged and the juvenile departments are required to initiate that process and, and notify uh, agencies that ha that hold records of the, the requirement that they expunge them and then notify the youth that the record's been expunged. That's awesome. Thank you, Dina. Thank you for sharing that. 
you know, and I guess I would just comment about the mental health treatment readiness pilot. I, I love that again, you know, y'all are getting upstream and really trying to figure out where the gaps are. Uh, and then the community violence intervention uh, prevention work too. So again, just uh, happy to see in the chair's budget uh, some of this funding to really help uh, some of our most um, at promise youth and adults. So thank you. I know you all have a hard job and appreciate your work and your commitment to the county and all of your, your staff. You represent hundreds, thousands of people. And I know that they're not all in this room and I know that this, this work is really hard. So it is appreciated. Mr. Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, Erica, Jay, Dina. Dina, congratulations. Uh, I hope you've got some exciting plans for what comes next. That's really it. And thank you so much for your years and years of service to the county and to the youth of the county. Um, it's such important work. Um, do you have a couple of questions? Oh, and I also want to thank Aaron and the CBAC for your uh, for your hard work and your really thoughtful comments. Um, and my first couple of questions pick up on um, some of the points that Aaron raised. So um, <clears throat> the point about supervision numbers going down and yet um, the budget uh, increasing, Jay, I think you addressed this. And what, what I understood you to say was that with the cuts that supervision, the state cuts that we in funding that we experienced four years ago, caseloads went up. And so the budget now reflects, um, well, I, I now reflects a more um, optimal caseload. I'm I'm curious about you know for FY22 it looked like the budget. Well, sorry, I'm a little, little bit of brain fog going on right now, but um, it looks as if the FY22 to 23 budget. This, the numbers of uh, under supervision are going down and the budget is going up. Can you can you talk about that and how it relates to your point about the funding cuts that were made four years ago? Yes, uh, Commissioner Jayapal, very good point. Uh, you know, I think when you reflect back to, you know, four, six and eight years ago when we had kind of steady cuts from the state and then you look at the place where we're at now, maintaining the place where we're at now, it's not just caseload size. I know that caseload size is a big piece of it. We believe that on a lot of our caseloads, having that 35 to 50 gives us the optimal level. And that has only been recently restored and hopefully main, maintained. When you looked at how we cut things in the past, it's some of the stuff that is going on now. For instance, the mental health treatment readiness thing, that would not have been able to have been achieved four years ago. That those are not state funded dollars. It's it's it, um, you know we had to cut our longer learning uh, back to school GED program. We had to cut our um, um, alternative to jail sanctioning program. About fourteen staff. Those kind of wrap around services of probation, which is supervision services and sanction. Those are the things that fell by the wayside of, in addition to caseload sizes going up. So not only did we cut parole and probation staff, but we also cut all these supportive things. We believe that we're at a, a place now maintaining with this budget to keep some of those things the way that they are. Um, we do a lot of things with our with our caseload size that don't have anything to do with an actual PO to caseload size, we have a pretty robust intake program where we're going to meet people at the front door, uh, give them the intakes that 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 they need. We have staff that can do reach-ins in uh, prison. All those things are really what is the right thing to do, but they those right things to do are not fully funded by the state based on some of those cuts. So those are the things that that we're able to maintain under this budget system the way that it is. Thank you. That that's really helpful. And I, I think you know when I was when I was trying to look through the the program offers, and think about this point that the CBAC is raising, I was looking at the offers that specify uh, supervision. So supervision East, supervision West, for example. I think what I understood you to say right now is the things we've added: the mental health treatment readiness unit, which I think is great. Um, those are wraparound services. In addition to the strict supervision, you know, parole and probation offer, 
officers. So I think what I'm what I'm maybe focusing in on now is that even for those strict supervision um, related costs, those also seem to be going up, even though the supervision numbers are going down. And I'm, I'm wondering why that is. You know, some of it is just general personnel costs that go up with the actual practitioner. Um, you know, uh, as we are, you know, at the very, very start of our budget, we focus primarily on high risk people. What you do on a high risk person is the amount of hours that that go into to them. That all translates at a, at a bottom line that the, the state pays at a at a uh, capitated rate. Um, so that's where the the increased costs of supervising someone shows up. I don't know dollar for dollar if it comes out to maybe the question that you're trying to to get at, but I can certainly get back to you with some more detail on the actual hard supervision numbers, what it costs to do that. We do have a study from 2018, a time study and a cost study that does show that, and it does show Multnomah County and how we supervise a high in the dollars that go in there compared to the rest of the, the state. State doesn't compensate Multnomah County for that for that rate. You all do it. It, it is funded in large part because of general fund. If not, we would be running this on a $28 million budget. We wouldn't have any of these wraparound ser services and the actual hard supervision numbers that you're speaking to, it would be one to a 50. We wouldn't be able to do um, EPICS, which is our caseload st uh, strategy. We wouldn't have an intake system like we do now. We wouldn't be able to do a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, reaching and wraparound services. Counties that have the ability to do that have a lower cost of living, lower personnel costs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's one of the reasons that the 1145 group is getting back together. Paying $12.42 per head might come out perfectly even in a rural county with a cost of living. So not so much here. So that's why we rely heavily on county general fund to make up the difference. Yeah, and I remember that cost study and, and being sort of outraged by the discrepancy between what the state funds and what it actually costs. So, so totally get that. So, so yeah, any deeper analysis that you could provide would be really helpful. And maybe yeah, also we've written it down. We've written it down on the yeah. board. I know you're not in in here, so you can't see that your question has been uh, very well articulated by Christian Elkin, the fabulous nice. budget director. So we'll get some more specifics for you. That'd be great. And and included in that, Jay, um, you know, maybe a trend line on caseloads would also be helpful in illustrating the point that you're making. Um, so so the other question related to the CBAC points, flip the script. Um, kind of the opposite situation it looks like from the program offer where um, for last year we budgeted 30 people being served by that. The estimate is actually going to be about 80. We're projecting 80 for next year, but the, but the cost, the, the budget amount is going down a little bit. Could, could somebody talk about that? I'm actually going to um, ask Jalise Jones to come up and uh, talk to us a little bit about that, those trends. I'll enter lifeline. Phone a friend. <laughs> Good morning. For the record, my name is Jalise Jones. I'm the finance manager for DCJ. Good morning, Chair Kapoor and commissioners. Um, to answer your question, Chair Jarrah Paul, the budget actually didn't go down. When you look at our total budget, it's the same as last year, and there's a COLA that wasn't included, and that makes up the 2%, but it will be included in our FY23 budget. So there's really not a decrease at all. Once we factor in the COLA after July 1st, it'll bring it back to the same budget as it was in FY22. Okay. Thank you, Jalise. You're welcome. Um, and then, Dina, a question about the juvenile detention facility. You know, um, it is bigger than we need. It's, it's 191 beds and we use, we use 56. How are the operating costs for that facility factored into the budget. In other words, are the operating costs for the, for the facility just sort of averaged out into the into the per bed costs that we have for the program offers or those beds? Um, I guess what I'm the bigger question I'm trying to get at is, are we 
paying more for the fact that we have a facility that is underutilized. I don't know if I can give you a technical answer. I will say we do have units that are used for other purposes. So one of our units is a library, for example. Um, one of our units uh, is an incentives unit where youth can go and they've earned privileges to play video games and ping pong and whatever. Uh, so that's not like a sleeping unit, but we are using those areas for um, programming and as an incentive and reward for youth who are exhibiting good behavior to get to go off of their living unit to engage in other activities. Uh, the facility was built with 191 beds. I don't think we ever operated 191 beds uh, close, but um, the, the facility is the facility that we have. Uh, and I, I would probably have to do a little more research and work with our finance folks to help you understand how the costs are actually determined. Mostly we, we talk about operating costs in terms of the staff that we need to operate the facility at 56 beds. But certainly there are hard costs that are, uh, uh, that are related to just having a building, whether it's being used or it's not being used. And we've got that question written down as well too, Commissioner. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm imagining Christian off, off my screen writing questions yeah. down. So thank you. Thanks, Dina. Um, and then last question for now about the community violence intervention uh, programs, which again, just really great to see and so important. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, there, there are many and they're sprinkled throughout the budget. I'm, I'm thinking about um, the one that expands heat and adds you know, the, the focus on Latinx um, uh, folks and the community health specialists. And, you know, the outcomes that we have in the budget um, relate to like how many people are referred to wraparound services. I'm curious about going a little deeper than that. How are we evaluating the success of those programs? Is it, is it that outcome, that kind of outcome, the number of people referred to services, or are there other outcomes that we that we look at when we determined how effective those programs are? Commissioner, I'll talk about the uh, Latinx program, and then Erica can take the the heat one on the Latin. X one, uh, um, we are very, very close from launching that. We basically tried to model a community healing initiative model that POIC had. Latino Network is the, or is the uh, community pro provider who put together a curriculum for that. Job placement, job readiness, um, life skills, cognitive therapy. We're going to have a caseload of about 30 that's going to try to populate that. So yeah, we're going to get how many people are referred, but we're going to have our research team monitoring, you know, how many people were referred to job placement, how many got jobs, how many people referred to this kind of program, how did that, how did that all work out? We're always going to get the abscon rate, the arrest rate, and re recidivism rate. We are going to be very deliberate with this program as to what services they provide and did it make a difference for those you for those unique life skill things. So that's something that is in the works probably in the, within the next couple months. Thank you for that, that question, uh, Commissioner Jayapal. And also, I just want to let you know that a priority for DCJ is going to be focusing on um, really our, our evaluation of our programs. We have a new research and planning manager. We had a couple of years where that, that position was in transition. Uh, Dr. Jen Rourke um, has already started doing some very amazing kind of qualitative analysis and really um, reaching out to some of our community providers so that we can begin that process of really making sure that we're aligned in our um, our goals and also aligned with what we're measuring and how we're measuring success. Um, and so we are going to be prioritizing that in our future with our research and planning team um, as well. We also are, um, we've had some funding for, for instance, with um, HEAT, um, we were funded by a SMART grant. And, um, and so we're in the midst of evaluating that program right now. Um, its effectiveness, its impact on the clients, its impact on the people that are doing the work. We were able to do that also with our, 
our, um, our work that we did with trauma informed practices and with equity through our smart grant um, that we had in 2000, I believe it was uh, 9, 2018. So, yes, program evaluation is a priority for us um, and aligning uh, not only the numbers of people serve, but also with the impacts that they're having on our community will be something that you will see us doing in the future. That's great. And those, all of those sorts of evalu evaluation measures were exactly um, what, what I was thinking about. Really appreciate that. And, you know, I think it would be what, whatever timing works for you when you feel that you've got enough information to have a briefing on the evaluate on what those evaluations show uh, sometime in the next year would be great. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Erica and Jay and Dina. Oh, I'm, I am really going to miss you and I, but I am very happy for you and um, congratulations. I, I too have a number of questions um, and some are larger, some are smaller. Um, and it, one of the sort of bigger questions is around um houseless individuals and um they we i know you always see in the press and people talk about criminalizing people who are homeless um but people who are living unhoused are some of the biggest victims of violence um trafficking rape assault i mean it, horrific things that are happening they have the least access to services so how are, is, is that something that you are looking at as we're looking at how to address um, victims of violence, et cetera, in our communities? How are you engaging? And, um, yeah. So I would say that the first thing that we're doing is we're really just trying to be out in the community so that we can be responsive to the needs of the houseless individuals. Our mental health outreach van, even though it says mental health, it is a van that's there to connect people to the resources that are within our department, as well as resources that are in the county. One of the other things that I think that we are doing that really is trying to understand where are the gaps and understanding what the needs are and reaching um, our, our houseless community is really in increasing our collaboration and our partnership with other departments within the county such as the health department, such as DCHS, um, so that we can make sure that we're maximizing county services, that we're not duplicating services, that we are seeing the gaps, that we are problem solving, that we are building relationship and partnership to be able to reach those folks. In our victim and our um, survivor services, um, what we're finding, especially during the pandemic, is that there is a lot of need uh, with people that are struggling in our community for um, advocacy. And so um, as we move into our next year, we are going to be talking about that. Currently, we have culturally responsive um, victims advocates, um, but as we uh, move into our future, we'll be working with our victim and survivor services to see where else can we have advocates that are um, that have specializations to work with people in our community. So what I think that you have um, really identified, Commissioner Myron, is a little bit of a gap with our houseless as far as our outreach to them, particularly as victims. But that is absolutely something that we will be um, identifying in the past. In the continuum, we serve. We serve people on our caseloads. Um, we uh, work with community partners that work with people um, that are houseless. And we also need to ensure that we have that nexus that's very intentional within our victim and survivor services. Yeah, no, and I, I appreciate that acknowledging it as a as a gap. Um, and uh, and I I would like to talk more about this maybe offline, just because with an investment of you know million however much it is, to have this big of a gap in that particular area is really you know something that that it feels like we could be addressing um this coming fiscal year or not can i also add uh, commissioner myron that we that people that are connected to our caseloads that are houseless so people that are on our caseloads probation and parole officers also triage 
um, those people that are victimized because of being houseless. And, you know, even though there might not be a direct nexus, so we don't have an advocate that works with particularly our houseless in individuals, our probation and parole officers also are collaborating with our victim and survivor services related to the needs of the clients that are on their caseload. So if someone has been victimized and there is a nexus to the services, then that is a, a pathway that is always accessible within our department. Thank you. Um, I guess, um, yeah, uh, in terms of the, you know, the mental health outreach van and connecting people to resources and departments and trying not to duplicate services. So what what is the difference between and how are you coordinating? There at least there are about 10 ish outreach services that provide what sound like very similar services to different groups who are living outside unsheltered. Um, how are you coordinating with the rest of those to be providing that value added that only your department can provide or that is directed toward your your particular goals rather than a lot of the other outreach that that we see? Good question. Uh, some of it is just being deliberate as to what we're doing and what we're not. We're not doing in as an example. The outreach van started basically as one a idea that we always kind of had. We, we, we'd like to get out there and kind of meet people where they're at. What services can can they get? A van has actually capacity for things like socks and blankets and those kinds of things, but also it provides us the ability for us to go and see people where they're at. COVID sped that up a bit. So we were we we didn't necessarily want people um, getting on buses coming down to a see us. So it kind of fit both purposes. Now we were very deliberate that we were going to start with just that. This is what it's going to be. While we're doing that, we are meeting with county behavioral health on on their programs where could this go in the future? So I think what you're getting at is as we move to the future, what do we already have and where can these two things, where can programs complement one another? And that's an ongoing conversation that we're, we're having with our county providers every week, it seems like. So we that goes back to that collaboration that we have with uh, the health department and DCHS. We know that there's probably outreach throughout our city. We we know that. Um, and you and I've had this conversation before, Commissioner Myron. And I think there's opportunities there. Um, and we would be we would welcome to be at any table where they're coordinating all of the outreach that's going on throughout the city and throughout the county. Um, and we can get you some more information because there might be some places where John is John McVeigh is our manager of our mental health, um, our, our mental health unit, and we can get you more information about where we are those tables that we are coordinating at. Um, we just don't have those specifics right now. That would be great and and just and we'll definitely have you there. There is a table as a matter of fact, but I mean, there's so many tables, so many but, tables. Um, but 1, I'm. I'm I've been working with Commissioner Maps on at the city in and and some other folks there and here in terms of kind of coordinating that because it has been an issue for a while. So um would love to talk more about that. Okay. And can I say one more thing? Yeah. I was gonna say that the mental health van initially when we put it out there, there was a the pandemic really had a huge impact on our uh, our clients that were uh, within our mental health unit and it really was very much to meet them where they were at you know they, they to meet them in the community and to make sure that we can engage them and connect them and sometimes they just if the van is in the same place every single day they they're there they know and they can count on it so it's also to create trust to build community and to draw people deeper into services as well so i just want to make sure that i made that that point about the mental health fan yeah no i appreciate i mean the outreach there's no question outreach i mean the the relationship the connections all of that is is fundamentally important um and i i guess trying to fit it into the multitude of outreach that's out there that does you know with socks and blank you know all of the stuff creating relationships how it how that fits together i think is more the the question i had and 
I do, you know, in terms of the, I, I do want to do a shout out. I know we're going to hear from the sheriff's office, but the hope team really is um, a phenomenal, phenomenal model that gets to its outreach and it provides, they started by looking at People who are houseless are victims of crime more, but they are isol I mean, they are people who truly do not even feel like they could ever contact law enforcement, whatever. And so they're they're kind of doing things in a very um, integrated and holistic way, which is actually really cool. So anyway, um, I did have a question about victim and survivor services in general, and I, you know, there's going to be a lot of investment in this. And I guess one of the questions I had, and I feel like I also asked this. Um, this was like a Lipsic executive meeting years ago um, when I first became aware of this issue, and one of the questions was how are we reaching victims of of crimes you know how is it that we're getting out to them and the the measurement was letters sent you know letters sent to the victims and my supplementary question was so how do we know you know how do we know the letters were received how do we know like what's the follow up how do we get the denominator like there were a number of questions regarding that to understand who's responding, who are actually even reaching, and may, you know, the letter just never got to someone. Has there been any, are we, are we still just sending letters, or is there more to that program at this point? And I'd be happy to hear details at another time, but. Yeah, I think that we can get you details at a, another time. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, because what I'm hearing the question being is really, yes, we're sending letters. How do we know people are receiving those letters and, you know, what's happening with the people once they, they do receive those? And so what we can do is work with our victim and survivor services to have a better sense of what that looks like, um, those, how they're receiving letters, how many get returned. Um, but, uh, but I can give you that information later. Okay, just yeah, the touches and data because I think that's been around for a few years, and so what the sort of trajectory has been with that, and and if we've done every anything differently there, and and seen change so that we could build on that. I was going to say that I I know that um, recently what's happening with our victim, they are really working hard to track their data and and really set up platforms for doing that. So I think that you know. We'll be able to give you some really um, some some good data related to their effectiveness and what they're doing. That would be awesome. And and along those lines, I know I wanted to thank Aaron as well and all the members of the CBAC. He had mentioned that um, that for victim victim and survivor services that you know this is life saving work that will decrease further violence. Um, and just to that's how he described that work. And if you could connect, I mean, I think I have a somewhat sort of an understanding of that intuitively, but like, could you just connect those dots for me, how that work um, of victim and survivor services is decreasing violence in the community, further violence, and we account for that or measure that in some way? I think what's important to note about our victim survivor services is that we acknowledge as DCJ that the reason why we are a department is because there's victims in our community. And when the victim and survivor services was incepted within DCJ, it was because we knew that the people that were on our caseloads had nexus to victims in our community and we wanted to make sure that they had a voice and that we were intentional about having a resource that was there for them that they were communicated with when there were events happening with the person who may have harmed them in our community so really what we um, have done is created a team that is able to be responsive to the needs of victims in our community particularly those who have been victimized by people that are on our caseloads. Here's how I believe that we connect these dots. By having a victim survivor services unit within DCJ, 
we're able to provide training around restorative practices. Um, and so our victim survivor services, I'm going to uh, just uh, give a shout out to Rhea Dumont, who is a restorative practices expert in our community, working with multiple partners about how to build restorative practices within our community. So that's a nexus to community safety is when we're able to bring community and people who have harmed them into spaces where they can restore relationship, restore safety. The other place is that our victim survivor services not only uh, is working with our criminal justice partners, they're working with our POs. They are making them informed of the rights of our victims and really the issues that our victims face, our, our victims face which helps them to really understand and enhance the way they do their case management, the way they build their case plans. So really the nexus is increasing the capacity and the knowledge and the awareness of victims issue with our direct, our frontline workers, our probation and parole officers, our juvenile court counselors, working with our judges so that they understand the issues that victims are facing in our community so that we as a system, similar to what um, Abby was talking about with transforming justice can really um, make sure that our services are doing right by the victims in our community. So raising the voices of our victims, increasing the awareness and um, helping us to improve our services to meet the needs of the victims in our community. And that's where I see. I just to jump in here because I know that um, this topic about victim services is something that I'm seeing a trend line through of interest level from all the commissioners. So I'm going to propose, um, and we're getting short on time as the sheriff's team is in the back. I'm going to propose that on June 7th, we schedule a uh, additional meeting with DCJ to talk about victim services, to talk more about the mental health unit, and then um, supervision trends if you have some at that time. And then we can, and if, if folks, um, you know, while you're thinking about this, if you come up with other questions that you want asked um, or, or areas for conversation at that briefing, that we can, um, we can do at that time. That is perfect because all of my questions that are remaining have to do with those issues. So all right, awesome. that'll be perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, team. Good to see you all. See you again on June 7th. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Last but not least. It's the Multnomah County Sheriff, Mike Reese, and his team. Good morning, Under Sheriff Nicole Morrissey O'Donnell, Sheriff Reese. Welcome. Cast of thousands. <laughs> We're looking for our CBAC member, uh, Dwight Holton should be here to join us, but he isn't here. Um, well, you know what? We weren't scheduled to start till 11 and I don't know if he was planning on being here at 11. It is, uh, 10 4. So maybe we should. Pause for a few moments. Okay. Thank and you. wait till 11. Thank you chair. Yeah. Thank you. We will pause. But that doesn't mean you can't talk amongst yourself.
11 o'clock, <clears throat> nearly on the dot. So we'll get, get so we'll get started. Good morning. Welcome. Chair Corey and commissioners, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mike Reese. I'm the Multnomah County Sheriff, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. As an elected official and as an administrator, I appreciate the difficult decisions that have to be made in developing a budget that meets the needs of our community. Today is, of course, a very special day as we celebrate our democracy and the election process where, we, where new leaders are selected. I have to say it's a little bittersweet for me personally as this is my last MCSO budget process. I have appreciated working so much with all of you on our shared responsibility for funding public safety, especially during the challenging times we've had. In developing the years, uh, this year's proposed budget, my executive team and I met with the chair's office, command members, our uh, community budget advisory uh, committee, and our labor association leadership. Of course, we always ask challenging questions and um, want to be mindful of um, old ways of doing business. Are there efficiencies that we can create in our budget processes? We weighed new policy priority priorities and leveraging other county resources. We continue to break down silos within our system to look for new opportunities and efficiencies. And of course, we invested in new partnerships with contract cities and social service providers. Uh, before we begin, I just want to take a moment to recognize the chair's office, the MCSO budget staff alike for their patience and professionalism throughout the year. Uh, we meet monthly to review the sheriff's office budget to ensure a shared awareness of our operations. And I want to thank Christian Elkin, Ashley Manning, Michelle Myers, and Scott Schlimpert for all of their hard work. And of course, the chair's staff for attending as well. So thank you so much. And could we go to the next slide, please? So here's our budget for this morning. It's got a lot to cover, so I'm going to just jump right in and we'll go to the next slide, please. So you're looking at a picture of Sergeant Steve Dangler out on one of our beautiful rivers in Multnomah County. And he exemplifies public service. Uh, our mission is to support all community members through exemplary public safety service. And Steve and our River Patrol team certainly do that every single day. Uh, we kicked off uh, recently the, uh, the boating season. And I was out there with Steve and his team. And they're just fabulous representatives of MCSO and our community. So can we go to the next slide, please? <laughs> So our vision for Multnomah County is a safe and thriving community for everyone. Our values provide a foundation to highlight how our agency upholds integrity and trust. We serve everyone with dignity and respect. We have the courage to do what is right and what is just. We believe all voices should be heard and valued. We practice unwavering commission, uh, compassion. We believe in fair treatment, access, opportunity, and, and advancement for all people. We hold ourselves and each other accountable, and we strive for continuous improvement. We are dedicated to an environment of safety, trust, and belonging in which all of our employees can thrive. Next slide, please. MCSO recognizes the Community Budget Advisory Committee's proud history of community leadership strong recommendations and independent deliberation through Multnomah County's budget process. MCSO CBAC members pictured here have been attending monthly meetings since September, and I am, pressed, I am impressed with their collective contributions to the development of this year's budget. I wanna thank each of these members for volunteering their service. It's also important to recognize the Office of Community Involvement. Community participation is a hallmark of good governance, and we have appreciate their work in facilitating this community uh, partnership with us. Joining us this year is, of course, Dwight Holton, who you've um, met in the past. He's been our budget CBAC chair for uh, several years, and I'm gonna turn it over to Dwight now. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, I wanna begin by echoing the Sheriff's appreciation for the work that you and your office do, Madam Chair, as well as uh, commissioners. Um, even in a relatively bountiful year, budget choices are really hard. And um, we see that firsthand as CBEC members and we appreciate the, um, you know, the hard decisions you have to make. Um, I also wanna step back for just a moment and um, make some observations from a 30,000 foot level. 
uh, while there is much worse work to do and we have just begun really even to think about what a trauma-informed criminal justice system looks like, I think it's really important to rec recognize the progress and commitment this county has made. Uh, basically, every year now for the many years I've served on the CBAC, I think it's six, eight, something like that, years, um, we have seen further evidence of the sheriff's office's commitment to using incarceration as a last resort uh, in addressing public safety challenges. As the population of the county has continued to grow, the incarcerated population has continued to shrink, not just as a matter of percentage, but as an absolute number. And that reflects the sheriff's office commitment to doing better and figuring out better ways to address public safety challenges. Um, likewise, this, this sheriff's office has taken on equity and inclusion as a core priority and been working to build the imperative relationships that have been strained beyond breaking by generations of racial injustice, often with law enforcement at the center of the problem. Um, this work has spanned from bridge building to more innovative efforts to integrate, like the effort to integrate public health into the work that the sheriff's office does and to tackle the pandemic of substance use disorder exacerbating all of these public safety challenges right now. Uh, I can tell you, having traveled the nation as a law enforcement executive um, and former law enforcement executive, um, you will not find a sheriff more effective in this work and more effective exploring innovation and community relationships to build a stronger and safer community. So since this is my last time in this seat next to the sheriff, uh, to Sheriff Reese, I wanted to exercise my prerogative and thank you. Um, as a citizen, as an, as a colleague, and as a friend for being such a progressive, thoughtful partner. Um, the CBAC this year, um, uh, our CBAC um, continued a really interesting exploration where we tried to figure out the right balance of our role. It, it's not obvious, frankly, right? On, on the one hand, um, broadly speaking, any budgetary item is relevant to the Budgetary Advisory Committee and therefore everything is on the table. Uh, on the other hand, the CBAC is not meant to be the advisory board for the sheriff's office, right? That's your role, and um, that's partially your role. And um, and so picking out that balance is not obvious because we could spend all of our time talking about things like incarceration rates or foreclosure or um, um, uh, accountability, um, but at the same time, it, we have a fairly limited role and we're privileged or democracy into these roles where we have a louder voice. So we tried to get to a, a positive place by focusing on core values. Um, and we developed a list of core values that we found really important. Transparency, uh, justice transformation, improved outcomes for community and the individuals in the, in the criminal justice system, uh, accountability, um, the importance of data and making data informed decisions, and respect for differing opinions among the among the committee as well as in the broader community. Um, through these values, we developed a series of priorities which were reflected in our report to the chair. Uh, we placed an emphasis on expanded training, on uh, providing excellent services to adults in custody and resources for them uh, to make this not just about punitive and punishment, but about rehabilitation and opportunity post incarceration, equity and inclusion, um, and looking for ways to replace incarceration with expanded rehabilitation, employment services, and supervision opportunities outside of that context. Uh, next, next. Yeah. Um, um, we ended up highlighting three program recommendations um, out of, we went through a process, looked at a long list, and ended up highlighting three expanded training um, to support a re-envisioned training program that offers more core companies beyond what's mandated by the state. Um, if you want to look at systemic change, nothing is more important in a law enforcement setting than training. That's just the way, uh, the way we set the tone and the standard for what happens. Um, booking and release, um, we prioritized um, restoring unbudgeted staff positions critical to intaking and releasing adults in custody. And the third priority we identified was an emphasis on wellness for the staff with the creation of a wellness coordinator position. 
we appreciate that the chair was able to fund two of those three priorities, all except for the wellness uh, in the in your budget. We hope that you'll consider that third priority. Um, but we appreciate the work you've done. Um, I just want to close by saying, as we continue on our effort to understand exactly where our scope and role is, we've had assistance from Danny Bernstein and others at the Office of, of Neighborhood Involvement, but I think that's an evolving process because we definitely found ourselves in some hard decisions where uh, some members wanted to voice concerns about some things, whereas, whereas others thought, geez, we hadn't really covered that and it's not really in our turf. Um, so understanding what our turf and what our role is and how we can be supportive of the commission is a priority that we'd like to understand a little bit better at the CBAG. Um, I want to close by saying thank you to the staff of the of the sheriff's office who took their lead from Sheriff Reese in providing tremendous support for us. We met a ton and we they were frankly extraordinarily patient in taking us into areas that they've never taken the CBAC before to understand the we kind of spent the summer talking about well what priority issues do we want to do a deep dive on to understand better whether or not it's part of the budget recommendations whether or not it's part of the program offerings what do we want to look at and the sheriff's office took us on that ride as it were they could easily have said geez that's not really your job but instead they they stood up and said let's help you figure out and help understand so uh, aaron hubert and john harmslot and i also want to say that under sheriff nicole morsey was there at every step with us taking a very keen interest in this process and we appreciate it Thank you. Thank you for your many years of service. I'm happy to do it. We keep trying to find somebody to replace me, but I, I keep missing the meeting where we decide who the chairperson is. Here I am. That's, Dwight has been priceless in this process, and I really appreciate his leadership. And if you look at our CBAC, we have exceptional members who have a deep understanding of public safety and public service. We appreciate all of their work. All right, next slide, please. Thank you, Dwight. And I want to just say another thank you to our Community Budget Advisory Committee. So good morning, Chair and Commissioners. For the record, I'm under Sheriff Nicole Morrissey O'Donnell, and I'm happy to be here to share our work of MCSO today. Once again, we appreciate everyone's flexibility and dedication to our budget process throughout this really challenging time. We believe in communication and transparency as we manage our shared responsibility for public safety. We hold monthly budget meetings with the budget office and the chair's office staff to share information on our projections throughout the year. In fiscal year 2022, we had the opportunity to work with the board through numerous issues noted here on this slide, including multiple presentations on our work at TriMet, as well as our investments to reduce community violence through the business income tax funding. We look forward to continuing to share initiative updates throughout the next fiscal year. Public safety professionals have been called upon to remain steadfast in our mission to protect and serve our community. As essential frontline professionals, we have partnered with healthcare providers, emergency housing supports, advocates, system stakeholders, and local government to ensure our community members, including those who are the most vulnerable, are safe. A safe and thriving community for everyone includes those in our neighborhoods and those on pretrial monitoring or in custody settings where we are responsible for their well being, rehabilitation, and service connections. We remain deeply committed to providing public safety services through key initiatives that are focused on recruiting, hiring, and retaining employees, investing in employee training, reducing community violence involving firearms and managing the care and custody of those housed within our corrections facilities. You will hear more in depth about these efforts from our chiefs and our equity and inclusion director as we move through our presentation today. Next slide, please. At MCSO, we are committed to treating everyone with dignity, respect, and fairness. We cannot achieve this without a focus on equity and a commitment to holding ourselves accountable to our community's call for transformational reform and change. Working toward justice means identifying and removing barriers for those who have been marginalized. And our communities are growing more diverse and we are responsible to meet the needs of each community we serve. MCSO understands that representation matters in creating community specific solutions and building and maintaining trust. 
As an agency, we are committed to increasing and retaining the diversity of our membership and striving for a workforce that continuously mirrors the community we serve. We are looking within, examining our policies and procedures to make sure they reinforce equity now and into the future. To discuss this further and our participation in the county's workforce equity strategic plan, I will now turn it over to Equity and Inclusion Director Rebecca Sanchez. Next slide, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, for the record, my name is Rebecca Sanchez. I'm the Equity and Inclusion Director at MCSO, and I use she, her, AIA pronouns. And it's a pleasure to speak with you all again. Um, MCSO continues to message throughout our agency that as public safety servants, equity and inclusion work is everyone's work. As we continue to move forward in our equity and inclusion journey, we are connecting this message with actions by setting new expectations on how to approach our public safety work. From the utilization of equity lens tools to guide our daily decision making processes to a steadfast commitment to ensuring greater inclusion of diverse perspectives, specifically those most negatively impacted. Our agency is getting a little more comfortable with uncomfortable conversations, and we are starting to see the advantages of questioning the old ways of doing things and the strengths in greater collaboration within our agency, across the county, and throughout the vast community we serve. Pictured in this slide that's up is MCSO member Leela Gorman, who is holding a new additional corrections resource called the Adults in Custody Orientation and Resource Guide. This new resource was developed in collaboration with multiple MCSO units adults in our custody and system partners. This new resource centers the needs of the adults in custody by not only providing an overview of the corrections environment, court processes, medical accessibility, and information on the Prison, elimination, uh, the prison Rape Elimination Act, but it is also available in five languages, it includes fillable calendars, additional spaces to write notes, and cover art by an adult in custody. As we began our budgetary process again this year, we continued to learn how to weave equity into our historically technical process. We continue to work with our managers and teams to more holistically infuse our program offers with our agency values, with the clear aim to reduce systemic harms which negatively impact members and community. Last winter, our executive leaders participated in an MCSO specific equity and empowerment lens training specifically designed to be used in our policy review process. This training was co-developed with Daniel Garcia when he was working in the Office of Diversity and Equity. We were extremely grateful for the opportunity for our executive leaders to learn more in depth about the Equity Lens tool. And we are now better equipped with a foundational understanding on how to utilize and apply the Equity Empowerment Lens, not only to policy reviews, but to the budgetary process and everyday decisions. We look forward to continuing this process and are working to incorporate enhanced training to more fully address uh, harmful outcomes as we move forward. Our equity and inclusion committee turns two years old this September, and we are celebrating a continual increase in membership and participation. This internal committee, whom at this moment identify as 60% BIPOC, 40% LGBTQ+, 20% immigrants, and 75% non-sworn, is providing our agency with a different perspective on which to examine the impacts of both policies and procedures as related to workplace experience. Next slide, please. MCSO worked, um, actively worked on the WESP throughout 2021 and have either met or are close to meeting the majority of the minimum standards and performance measures set forth in each of the focus areas. This is a significant increase from 2020 when MCSO first began engaging in the WESP. As we are developing MCSO specific approaches to meet the WESP objectives, we are challenging ourselves to do things differently and to lean into our commitment to inclusivity and to center equity within each approach. For example, 
our mentorship program, which we call the Mentorship Guide Initiative, was first developed and proposed by then Deputy and now Sergeant Aaron Sikowski and is currently being piloted in our law enforcement division. However, we are committed to expanding this mentorship program across all three divisions to ensure every new member who joins our agency has the support to professionally succeed and thrive here. During the program's development, we've connected with our colleagues at the health department who are also developing their own mentorship program. We are excited to continue this collaborative relationship where we share and learn from one another. As part of our specific work on the WESP, focus area one, organizational culture change, this slide here shows myself and a member of our equity committee, Corrections Deputy Heidi Balmaceda, providing a presentation doing our new hire orientation, which we've titled Safety, Trust, and Belonging at MCSO. This presentation was developed by our equity committee with the following goals in mind. Introduce every new hire to the equity and inclusion values of our, both our agency and the county. Explain the what and the why of the Workforce Equity Strategic Plan. Explain what we mean by inclusively leading with race. And most importantly, we set the expectation for all MCSO members that equity and inclusion work is part of everyone's work. The MCSO fiscal year budget 23 requests an increase in training funds, which will be used to resource partnerships with community-centered DEI subject matter experts to support our efforts in fulfilling the goals of the WESP and our agency strategic plan. This goal for outside partnerships is critically important for our organization so we can upskill our members on equity and inclusion, foundational concepts, tools, and practices that will support our agency vision of a thriving community for everyone. MCSO will use the fiscal year 23 budget allocations to meet the following training goals. Sworn, uniformed, and civilian managers will receive diversity, equity, and inclusion foundational concepts training, which will be developed in collaboration with external subject matter experts. All new hires will receive a more in-depth training on DEI values and organizational support services during new hire orientation. Curriculum development and facilitation for annual in-service DEI training modules will be in collaboration with subject matter experts. DEI curriculum will be developed as part of an agency competency requirement for all staff that will be accessible through an online and interactive training platform. We want to emphasize that MCSO continues to be at the very beginning stages of our equity, inclusion, and belonging journey together. However, as the equity and inclusion director position continues to sit at the executive level and our equity and inclusion unit grows, the diverse perspectives from marginalized communities are increasingly being centered. It is encouraging to observe how talking about equity and inclusion is becoming more and more present throughout our agency, from high level meetings to daily work conversations. This is how we support sustainable and thoughtful change across our agency. I wanna thank you chair for supporting much of the budgetary requests from our agency and for supporting the journey that we have, we have begun and we remain committed to walking. I would like to, to now pass the presentation back to the sheriff. Thank you. We'll jump to the next slide. And as we're doing that, I just wanna say thank you to Rebecca. She is an incredible professional who has been very kind and gracious to all of us at MCSO and how she fosters courageous communications within our organization, within the communities we serve. Thank you so much. So uh, Rebecca and, and our under sheriff got to talk about fun stuff. I get to talk about organizational chart stuff. So uh, again, this is before we get into the fiscal pieces here, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about how our organization is structured. We ma we're made up of our executive office, business services, corrections facilities, correction services, and law enforcement divisions. I'm joined today, of course, by all of our chiefs and our under sheriff on our executive team. Uh, Under Sheriff Nicole Morrissey O'Donnell oversees our business services and law enforcement divisions. Chief of Business Services, Aaron Hubert, is responsible for training, fiscal, criminal justice information systems, logistics, enforcement support, and strategic services. 
And uh, our largest focus, as you can, uh, as you'll see in the budget presentation, largest focus of responsibilities and corrections. Chief Deputy Alexander oversees corrections facilities to include all operational aspects of our jails. Chief Deputy uh, Guidos leads our correction services, encompassing court services, facility services, and auxiliary services. And then Chief Deputy uh, Erickson leads our law enforcement division, which encompasses our patrol operations, investigation, search and rescue, and river patrol. So next slide, please. And as I said, I get the fun stuff. So here we are at budget by fund. And uh, depicted here are MCSO expenditures, which shows that public safety historically has been general fund reliant. Uh, we are open to ideas, of course, about how to lessen this reliance through grant applications, optimizing our use of facilities, streamlining operational processes, and new uh, revenue opportunities in the future. We are con uh, committed to continuous improvement and innovation to improve fiscal responsibility. Next slide, please. So this is a slide of our five-year trend of significant funds. Our budget over the past five years has been consistent given that personnel expenses are primarily general fund reliant. The federal state fund will increase in fiscal year 23 as compared to last year by approximately two and a half million dollars, uh, primarily due to two reasons. Senate Bill 1145 funding increased by $1.65 million. And our equitable sharing beginning balance for the Special Investigations Unit, that working capital carryover is $850,000. The bottom funds don't show much movement in the scale of this, but our special, our Justice Services Special Ops Fund consists of all the dedicated funds that are not in the general fund and are not federal grants. So that would include TriMet, Metro, our alarms fund, uh, concealed handgun license funds, and things of that nature. Uh, this fund increased uh, this fiscal year by approximately $2.2 million due to the addition of our TriMet contract. However, it decreases in next year's budget by approximately $775,000 due to uh, expiration of our Metro contract. And that contract supported both investigators that were assigned to Metro and work crew positions. So if we go to our next slide, please. So this is just uh, our personnel over the past five years. And you can again see that it's fairly static. Uh, as previously noted, MCSO personnel costs are funded primarily through the general fund. And it continues, we're gonna talk about this a little later, some of the trends and challenges in personnel continues to be a challenging time in public safety. Uh, retention has become difficult across the entire law enforcement spectrum nationally and locally. Uh, we have prioritized at MCSO hiring retention and recruitment strategies that we're gonna share with you a little bit later. And we continue to look for new ways to advance our work in a way that reflects the evolving values and our evolving uh, nature of public safety work. So next slide, please. This is budget by category. And again, MCSO's largest expense is our people which of course is our greatest asset. And it accounts for almost 80% of our total MCSO budget. And we'll go to the next slide, please. So we're gonna move into a uh, budget by each of our divisions. And I'm gonna start by, we'll flip to the next slide. I'm gonna uh, move quickly through some of these. Uh, these slide, this slide represents our budget by each of our divisions and uh, it's a percentage of our overall budget. Corrections facilities is our largest division followed by corrections services as illustrated in this particular slide. And we'll jump to the next slide, please. So I wanna talk, before I turn it over to the chiefs, I wanna talk a little bit about our executive office. The most notable difference between last year's budget and this year's proposed budget is additional HR staff necessary to meet the complex recruitment and hiring needs of a large public safety organization. We've added background investigators, recruiters, and technical staff to help accelerate a very competitive hiring process. We've also added a policy advisor to our executive team. This position leads all aspects of the policy work to include reviews with the executive team, facilitating subject matter expert review, 
and coordinating, and coordinating labor association participation. The policy advisor promotes organizational transparency by including community and governmental par partners in policy development and specifically ensuring a robust public pro process of our policy development. Finally, this important role addresses ongoing impacts of annual legislative processes and court cases that impact our policy and our work every day. The Sheriff's Office is committed to further developing a transparent policy process by partnering our policy advisor with our equity and inclusion director. They recently completed, as Rebecca pointed out to you, our equity and empowerment lens trainings and championed those trainings at the executive level. In the late fall of 2021, the executive leadership team received a two-part training on the equity and empowerment lens facilitated by a trainer from the Office of Diversity and Equity in collaboration with Rebecca. Our executive team, uh, our executive leadership team is now appropriately utilizing that equity lens in all policy development processes. So we'll jump to the next slide, please. This kind of shows our, our challenges if we look at personnel. This is uh, personnel trends 2017 to 2021. Sworn hires in each of those years, sworn separations, non-sworn professional staff hires and non-sworn uh, professional staff separations. Again, you can see by the slide that in 2021, we had in our sworn ranks, a number of retirements. Uh, in the past, we would have expected people to uh, stay, you know, once they were retirement eligible, maybe for a few additional years, 26 to 30 to 32, 33 years. We saw a wave of retirements as people reached the minimum uh, time of uh, retirement. Uh, I will say uh, through the uh, pandemic, 2020 and 2021, our hiring, we um, really, uh, in a very adaptive fashion, changed some of our hiring processes and maintained a consistent hiring level, which did not meet our needs, but at least kept us afloat. Recruitment and hiring and retention of employees is challenging. Our members bring their compassion and commitment to serve others to work each and every day. This work does take a heavy toll on our members and their families, on their physical, mental, and emotional health, which have been exacerbated by growing personnel challenges for the foreseeable future. The lingering effects of working through the pandemic has strained our human resource uh, staff like never before particularly in trying to hire sworn staff. Our members need a sustained commitment to their overall well-being. As we work towards reimagining public safety and transformational culture change within MCSO, we must jointly commit to the well-being of our members. To do this, we must uh, to do this, we must do better to retain members and keep pace with our vacancies. Over the past year, we have invested, as I've said, we've um, really uh, adapted to changing dynamics in hiring and recruitment. We've invested in marketing strategies and recruitment efforts using billboards, radio, and social media aimed at broadening our candidate pool and diversifying the folks that we are reaching out to. We're also offering competitive incentives to candidates already certified in corrections or law enforcement. So a lot of lateral uh, candidates are in our hiring processes right now. Retention strategies, of course, are a bit tougher to work on as we uh, have um, collective bargaining agreements that have um, a role to play in those uh, retention uh, strategies. And of course, we're in bargaining labor relations right now with our labor associations. Uh, Rebecca and uh, Nicole have pointed out our mentorship program that's being piloted in the law enforcement division and our revamped uh, peer support, which you'll hear about, to include leadership through Trauma Intervention Program Northwest. We are evaluating technical processes of hiring to create efficiencies, working with County Department HR staff, and we are deeply committed to reevaluating how we do business in our hiring practices. I am proud of the way our HR folks have innovated during the pandemic and our communications team to using online and virtual platforms to speed up the hiring process. Next slide, please. So here's some of our new hires. This is a, uh, this slide is a photo of one of our recent monthly hiring and promotion ceremonies where we celebrated our new staff. 
And I'm also pleased that this year we transitioned to a civilian manager to lead our professional standards unit, which is part of our executive leadership team. I believe that civilian oversight is one way to ensure trust and transparency in our systems of accountability within the sheriff's office. Professional standards unit conducts those internal investigations, gauges our performance through audits and inspections, and is developing an employee information system which will enable supervisors to have a more comprehensive view of the employees that work for them. And I'm now going to, we're gonna uh, move the deck chairs here a little bit. I'm gonna let you hear from our chiefs and uh, they'll talk about the budget uh, within each of their divisions. And I'll turn it over to Chief Aaron Hubert and we'll go to the next slide, please. Good morning, Chair Kafori and Commissioners. It's great to be with you in person this morning. It's great to not have to remember to unmute myself. <laughs> Just don't take that for granted. I'm Erin Hubert, Chief of the Business Services Division. And this morning, I'm gonna cover three slides with you that basically will give you an overview of the division and some of the units and one of our key areas of focus that you've heard a little bit about this morning. So it's been an exciting year. We got to open our training center this year in March. And this is a photograph of Francis Kopp, who has an appropriate name, uh, cutting the ribbon. He runs our law enforcement unit, which part of that work is housed in the training unit. This was our first in-person managers meeting that we were able to have at the training unit. So we did a little ribbon cutting, which was kind of cool. Um, some of the transformational work that the sheriff speaks to this morning and others starts in the business services division. Um, it gets grounded there and it's things like re reimagining the training program and reimagining re -imagining how and to what we should train. It's about continually assessing and evolving the data that we look at and that we collect and the, trans the trends that we're tracking so that we can make the most informed forward thinking decisions. It's uh, also a lot of technology to support the key changes that happen in the division comes out of business services, or excuse me, key changes that happen across the entire agency are supported out of the business services division. And then making sure that what we choose to prioritize for the budget is reflecting our evolving values and all of the good work that you've heard about today. And then even how we interact and dialogue with our CBAC committee and some of the things that Dwight mentioned earlier is really going deeper with this committee and having them truly understand the agency beyond just the budget. So a lot of exciting um, things happening in the business services division to support the vision of what we wanna do moving forward. A few key highlights I'll give you from some of the units that are taking place. We have a new leader in the fiscal unit, Scott Schlimpert. Most of you, I think, know him. He replaced Michelle, who spent amazing 26 years with us, and uh, you now have her talents in another part of the county. Uh, Scott and I are going to be working really closely this year with Rebecca Sanchez, our Equity and Inclusion Director. To, we had the training that you heard about with our Equity Lens last winter, and this will be the first chance to start at the beginning of a new budget year and really make sure we're in alignment with working with the lens and looking for any gaps in our in all of the budget processes that we have. So that will be exciting work. One of the areas that um, just still feels a little incongruent or not as in alignment as we'd like is the wellness program for our staff. Just given the, the increasingly tenuous nature of our members' wellness coming from the last two years, and then coming from such so many staffing challenges and mandatory over time. We were lucky enough to be funded last year for an equity and wellness position, but are seeing that it just isn't enough. We really need a dedicated wellness coordinator and resources to be able to address the critical issues that we're seeing. It's also um, a program that the wellness committee, excuse me, that the CBAC committee feels really strongly about. So I just wanted to make sure we mentioned that. A uh, few other key things, we, I would normally not report this as big news. We've changed our wireless provider from Verizon to FirstNet. The reason I thought it was worth pointing out is this now makes us 
part of a network of all emergency responders who can communicate during emergencies. This stemmed from 9-11 when there was so much chaos. So we are now able to communicate with all first responders. It's a public safety system that was designed in partnership with AT&T and it saved us money too. That was pretty cool. Um, we also in our logistics uh, unit, they have the exciting challenge of trying to find additional space that's controlled and secured for all the dispossessed guns that we're seeing come out of our gun violence reduction program. It has uh, worked beyond our imagination and we have lots more dispossessed guns we need to find safe spaces for. So they're working diligently on that. And then just finally, I would summarize for the overall division um, Sheriff touched on this. We're continually looking for ways to invest in new business practices that will speed things up, create greater efficiencies, um, particularly as we continue to grapple with staffing challenges. We are continually looking for ways to digitize manual processes and to also offer services, more and more services to the public via the web that makes it more accessible for them. Next slide, please. So I'm going to dive into training for a little bit. This is going to be a big area of focus for us this next year. You all saw this image during the budget process, which what we attempted to do was sort of break our program down into manageable pieces so you could really understand where all the money is going. And this broke it down into three categories, and you see them color-coded from kind of the yellow to the green to the purple, or at least that's how it looks to me. Um, and the, it's our sworn certified training. The state required training is one bucket of training. That's essentially been our core focus of training historically, and that's where all our attention has gone. We are expanding that in the reimagination, and we want to do far more around expanding core competencies for our uh, law enforcement officers, and then also include non sworn in the training. This is broken out by. Um, curriculum of training subjects in a kind of a summarized way here with related costs. And this has been updated since the last one you saw just to reflect the proposed funding level decisions that we received. It was mentioned before, uh, but training is an absolute foundational unit for the entire organization. The, the vision and the change that we want to see starts oftentimes in training in, in law enforcement and public safety. We are going to be focused on trying to move the needle and accomplishing three primary things next year. Evolve our sworn member skill sets, like growing and refining crisis intervention skills and behaviors that are culturally responsive and trauma informed. Further advance equity and inclusion across the entire agency. And more inclusively train and develop all staff members, not just sworn members. The million nine six two that we received to help advance our training program uh, we are very grateful for, and it will, it won't accomplish what's up here, but it will be a wonderful start to reimagining our program and setting a foundation for transformation across the operation. And we hope will, it also will help foster community trust and confidence in our agency. We're looking forward to building on this and continuing to grow our program in years to come so that we're optimally meeting the needs of our members and the community. Next, next slide, please. This final slide shines the light on some of the work that planning and research does for the, not only for the agency, but the entire county. They're really a pivotal unit beyond uh, the sheriff's office. And this particular slide is an example of a high quality, very easily accessible and a rich data dashboard that the planning and research unit provided on, uh, that helps us drive decisions. The, the data collection that they do informs our decisions, it informs partner agencies' decisions, it provides critical trends and vital information that not only helps us make informed decisions, but oftentimes life-saving decisions. This slide and other trend information like it is also provided to the public on our website so that they too can educate themselves in an easily, easy manner. The strain on our ju judicial system and combined with the changing crime patterns around us is requiring we stay up to date on emerging trends. So we're providing the most relevant data across the county. Um, as a result, planning and research is currently reevaluating all the data they analyze to ensure that they are providing the most up-to-date developments 
uh, used by just not only our agency, but again, other county partners. In addition, planning and research is the sole provider of key criminal justice data for our corrections uh, division. And so again, that's the only place that, that departments across the county can get that vital information. And then just finally, with everything that's happened with staffing, they're increasingly putting dashboards together for us tracking recruitment and projecting into the future what, future what our hiring needs are going to be because of the numerous retirements that we face now and are going to continue to face for probably about another three years. And then combined with the current stagnant hiring market, we just need more data around this to come up with better strategies. So that's it from business services. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And I will now turn it over to Chief Steve Alexander, who oversees correction facilities. Thank you, Aaron. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, I am Chief Deputy of Corrections Facilities, uh, Steve Alexander, and I am pleased to be here today. Um, so MCSO's FY 2023 budget submission funds 1,117 beds. Uh, jail beds. So the Corrections Facilities Division proposed budget includes the restoration of 3.64 FTE in booking and 1.82 FTE for a day shift control center position. The budget also continues the free weekly phone call program, which was established during the pandemic for all adults in custody, and we appreciate that. And then ARPA funds two of the dorms in this year's budget and provides continued support for further expansion of our digital delivery information signage in both jail facilities. We appreciate the opportunity to continue to fund adequate housing units for those incarcerated. This allows MCSO to stabilize jail beds, prioritize successful classification of individuals, and provide equitable access to programs. Next slide, please. So during the pandemic, we have maintained an overall lower average daily daily jail population, dropping from 1,071 in April of 2019 to 780 in April of 2022. Despite this historic low, you can see the number of individuals held pre-trial for more than 150 days has continued to grow steadily over the past several years. We have begun to identify an intensification of our corrections population. Not only do we recognize a growing number of individuals in custody awaiting adjudication for greater than 150 days, but also a significant increase in those incarcerated for murder-related charges. The population of these individuals has steadily grown for the past three years. Those in custody for 150 days or greater jumped from 195 individuals in 2019 to a peak of 257 in 2021, and currently sits today at 233. Murder-related charges also increased, growing from 69 in 2019 to 102 as of April of this year. We expect this continued increase in longer stay adults in custody as long as court processes are delayed and perhaps beyond that due to the increase in violent crime in our community. This growth will continue to put pressure on jail capacity, particularly in the event that dorm closures occur in FY23. Next slide, please. Since the early impacts of COVID-19, MCSO and our criminal justice partners have worked together to reduce and maintain a lower population in our jails. An additional two dorms was funded to lower average populations in dormitory settings and provide flexibility in our pandemic response strategies in the jail facilities. Our jail facilities continue to evolve as we move through the pandemic and we have worked closely with corrections health and public health partners to identify successful strategies and work to reduce COVID-19 impacts on jail populations to keep our adults in custody and staff safe. As we transition to longer term housing plan structures, we are working to identify opportunities to ensure equitable access to adults in custody who would benefit from specialty programs and mental health support. We are currently in the process of identifying specific housing units to support these efforts. Reduced necessity for classification modules for observation periods during COVID will allow for these expanded housing efforts for those who need this increased support during their time in custody. We know COVID-19 has not gone away. New intakes into the jail with COVID-19 symptoms or identified exposure risks are still being screened by Corrections Health and medically assessed to ensure housing is appropriately assigned to minimize risk to jail population and address individual medical needs. COVID-19 information is provided to both of our jail facilities. 
Materials updated regularly in our housing units, booking areas, and staff areas in multiple languages to maintain awareness of COVID-19 symptoms and encourage good hygiene and sanitation. COVID-19 vaccinations are regularly offered by Corrections Health and Medical Clinics to all adults in custody. Vaccine education information is also provided in both facilities to help inform adults in custody about availability of vaccine and opportunities to receive vaccine while in custody if they have not already. MCSO continues to realize a reduction in hospital watches and medical transports from the facilities as providers continue to moderate and be wary with service delivery as the pandemic has receded. We do have encouraging developments though, and an encouraging development in the stage of where we are at in the pandemic. In early April, social visiting reopened at both of our jail facilities. This included an expansion of visiting hours at our Inverness jail to provide more opportunities for visitation and to spread utilization over a wider period. And on a last note, I am pleased to report <coughs> the detention electronics projects upgraded MCDC has been completed with the installation of over 300 newer upgraded cameras and is a welcomed addition to provide more transparency to our jail operations and increased safety and security for both our staff and our adults in custody. Next slide, please. And now I'll turn it over to Chief Deputy Chad Guidus to walk us through the correction services. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Steve was correct. I am Chad Guidus, the Sheriff's Chief Deputy of the Correction Services Division. I appreciate your time this morning to share the work we've been doing over the last year. Deputy Loray Ross, who is pictured here, is part of our work crew unit, a team of deputies who has embraced the transformation of their work to focus on job readiness. She has been instrumental in the success of the Pathways to Employment Program, or PEP, which began last year as a pilot program in collaboration with Southeast Works to deliver job readiness training and career coaching to adults in custody. By providing access in our facility to the same resources available in the community, career coaches are able to pair adults in custody with employers willing to hire people who have been incarcerated. This leads to real jobs in the community. Often this is the first step to finding a path out of our justice system. Earlier this year, Deputy Ross saw another opportunity for innovation while working with an adult in custody at the MCIJ Laundry. During a conversation, Deputy Ross discovered the young man had not graduated from high school. She encouraged him to consider getting his GED while he was in custody and before long, with the help of staff from the Multnomah County Library, this encouragement led to a GED certificate. While the young man's success is encouraging, Far too many obstacles were found as the two worked together. Work has already begun to streamline this process, so the feeling of success felt by this young man is something we can reliably offer to anyone in, who is in our custody. The value of reach in services in our facilities cannot be overstated, and I'm pleased to report we've started a pilot program with Women First, a nonprofit whose work is aimed at providing empowerment groups to women in our custody through its I Love Me program. This invaluable collaboration is evidence of our commitment to providing culturally and gender specific programming that supports those who are in our custody as they look for a path out of justice involvement. By utilizing resources from our community who have lived experience, we create a continuity in services we believe leads to the warm handoff that supports those who may be fearful of where to turn at release. The first series began in April and I'm looking forward to our first graduation from the program. At the Multnomah County Detention Center, counselors work with those in our custody who have the highest rate of mental illness and substance use disorders. To best respond to the individual needs of those housed in this facility, our corrections counselors began a more one-on-one -on -one approach to service delivery. This work started by passing out coursework in weekly sessions that provided information on mindfulness, self-care, and art therapy activities to help relieve anxiety in the adults in our custody. These efforts provided a framework to move to an additional needs-based assessment and more expansive discharge planning model. This more expansive workload will greatly benefit from the addition of the supervisory position to be assigned specifically to MCDC. Thank you for including this important position in this year's proposed budget. This position along with funding for Southeast Works Career Coaches represents the increase in the services division budget noted here. Next slide, please. MCSO continues to participate in ongoing discussions with criminal justice partners regarding the makeup of our jail population. 
We've worked collaboratively with these partners to increase our use of pretrial programs, community monitoring, and determining who might be better served through early release to treatment or housing opportunities. The purpose of this work is to empower and support justice involved people to thrive in our community. To effectively reach this goal, we recognize the need to have systems and programs in place to redirect, support, and transition people who are released from our custody. This year, MCSO was awarded a grant to begin development of a behavioral health program that will pair a clinician in both our law enforcement division and closed street supervision unit to address the needs of those who are suffering mental health crisis in our community. Our hope is that all community members can avoid jail completely. To reach this goal, we are using grant funds to provide a means to have health and peer support professionals provide alternatives to persons in crisis and redirect them away from the jail and toward a community service provider. Those who are justice involved have very diverse needs. In the Correction Services Division, our aim is to identify those needs and offer appropriate supports to empower those who will inevitably who may inevitably find themselves in our jail or under closed street monitoring. For these individuals, our goal is to provide both immediate and long lasting support. In the jail, this looks like counselor led courses and skill building with a focus on culturally specific programming. While on closed street monitoring, this may be as simple as a person giving a person a cell phone or as involved as scheduling and transporting outpatient and court appointments. When these individuals leave our custody, our goal is to have a release plan in place that is commensurate with the needs of the individual. Ideally, this plan helps those in our custody make smooth transition back to their community supports and where applicable participate in treatment programs. I want to take just a brief break from my presentation to let you know that we have kept moving forward while the pandemic has asked many systems to stop. This is important um, from an agency perspective, but it couldn't be done without individuals dedicating themselves to doing something different. The person I'd like to introduce to you today is our programs unit manager. She's the MCSO point person for pretrial reform and the facilitator of the BJA grant program that I just spoke about with mental health clinicians. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Stephanie Lockruba, who's in the audience today. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie, for all your hard work. We certainly couldn't do it without you. Next slide. Here you see Deputy Ashroff and Deputy Muth work, who work in our court services unit, walking inside the beautiful new Multnomah County Central Courthouse. This state of the art facility has begun to see more regular use by the community and staff as pandemic restrictions lift and more court matters are being heard in person. This increase in workload is giving our team a chance to see where improvements can be made in our processes for both screening and staffing court matters. While this facility does offer significant efficiencies in our work, a backload in court cases and changes in how jury pools are summoned may lead to an additional need for staffing. MCSO is committed to working with our justice system partners to find advantages in scheduling and the use of technology to reduce reliance on staff alone to solve this very complex problem in our system. As part of this evaluation, I've asked our team to reach beyond the baseline screening we operate and consider where resources may be needed, excuse me, where resources may need to be augmented to add time and space to work more personally with the diverse community we serve as they navigate the very complex court process. Our facility security officers are an invaluable resource as ambassadors to our community, but low staffing levels continue to strain this unit and challenge the service model we strive to have in all our courthouses. Chief Deputy Alexander spoke earlier about the intensification of those who are in our custody. In the court services unit, this has led to more serious and complex court matters being heard all at the same time. Many of these trials require weeks to complete and create high demand on our limited staff resources. The number of trials being scheduled that include Measure 11 charges is unprecedented, and adjudicating these cases is critical in managing our jail population in the future. Staffing these matters has become challenging, and with several retirements planned in the unit this summer and fall, providing a safe court experience will require a heavy reliance on overtime in the coming months. Our team is constantly looking for innovative ways to collaborate with our system partners in an effort to reduce the backlog of court matters in our system and provide an efficient, safe environment for adults in our custody, staff, and the community who visit the Central Courthouse. Next slide. Thank you for your time today. We will now transition to Chief Deputy James Erickson to speak about our law enforcement initiative. Good 
Good afternoon, I think now. I think it's noon. My name is James Erickson, Chief Deputy of the Law Enforcement Division. I am pleased to be with you this morning or this afternoon to cover the great work we are doing in our community. I will start by covering a few key funding changes we have seen this year. The HOPE team continues to foster system partnerships to support our community. Through their compassionate outreach first approach, the HOPE team meets with community members where they are to provide accessible service to address their unique needs of each individual. Pictured here is Danny and Deputy Epperson. Danny was houseless for six years until the HOPE team established a relationship with him, assisting with safe housing and an employment opportunity, which Danny still holds today. The HOPE team will partner with the Behavior Health Connections team as they, are, as they open up the recruitment for hiring a clinician and a peer support specialist. The goal is to hire these two positions by the fall. The clinician will respond to crisis situations with a designated deputy, and that deputy and the clinician will respond to people in crisis to help with resources so they can avoid jail. The peer support specialist will support the community with those members after the crisis has occurred. In mid-year, MCSO utilized the business income tax to assist the programs that reduce community violence where firearms are used. The program included adding two civil deputies to the law enforcement division that focus on con connecting our system partners to follow up on those individuals served with protection orders that are required to dispossess their firearms. With this added resource, the team facilit facilitated the surrender of over 110 firearms since January. Also mid-year, we used the business income tax to fund a detective who is assigned to all gun violence calls that occur in our patrol jurisdiction. This detective also works with the FBI Safe Street Initiative that focuses on gun violence and scenes in the county. Next slide, please. The law enforcement division remains deeply invested in a data-driven approach to tracking crime trends and developing strategies to provide effective public safety services in our community. Violence involving a firearm throughout Multnomah County is a growing danger to our community's sense of safety, trust, and belonging. Firearms-related violence includes criminal acts committed with a firearm, family violence, group affiliations, and people at extreme risk to harm themselves or others. Individuals responsible for these crimes do not know, nor they distinguish jurisdictional boundaries. For example, a shell casing recovered in a shooting in East Multnomah County was fired from a gun used in a similar crime seven hours later in the city of Portland. Looking at data, the county eclipsed its highest number of homicides annually in 2021. Tragically, data indicates that Multnomah County experienced 102 homicides in 2021, with nearly all of them involving a firearm. Unfortunately, this trend is not slowing down. To address this, MCSO's dedication to coordinated public safety initiatives with our partners in removing illegal firearms has been a focal point. Our seizure of firearms increased in 2021 with 863 firearms seized, recovered, or surrendered to MCSO. The increase in traffic fatalities countywide is also shown an alarming increase. In Portland alone, there were 63 people who died in traffic crashes in 2021, compared to the average of 46 reported between 2017 to 2020. MCSO has begun deployment strategies on focused traffic enforcement and high crash corridors to reduce reckless and impaired driving. Through a resource of dedicated detectives and deputies, we remain committed and focused on intervening and addressing the increasing demands on community safety as it relates to gun violence and using strategies to prevent traffic fatalities. Next slide, please. Implementing a body-worn camera program can be a highly effective resource, providing an unaltered audio and visual record of interactions that capture evidence in an event of a crime, police-citizen interaction, or use-of-force event. 
This technology will also provide additional transparency in the daily operations of the law enforcement division. Body worn cameras will also build community trust, which is essential to effectively serving the size, complexity, and diversity of Multnomah County. This technology will provide deputies and community members with a greater accountability and a better understanding of critical events of public concerns. Additionally, the body worn cameras will facilitate fair and transparent adjudication of criminal and civil matters. We are currently completing policies regarding body worn cameras, which will involve robust community involvement. As we finalize this endeavor, we are hopeful that the board will support this program. Next slide, please. MCSO is proud to have taken on the administrative leadership of TriMet's Transit Police Division, and we are now one year into our partnership. In the short time MCSO has been involved in leading the Transit Police Division, we have immersed ourselves in concepts and reimagining public safety. The Transit Police Leadership Team and MCSO Equity and Inclusion Director, alongside TriMet's Community Engagement Coordinator, are working towards implementing recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Committee, which also incorporates models that are already in place as with MCSO's HOPE Team. We are focused on identifying innovative programs and providing new or enhanced training opportunities for Transit Police and TriMet staff to include partnering with training for transformation, which their logo is on the screen there next to the police car. Beginning next month, Transit Police and TriMet will start a 12-week training course designed to support public safety personnel responding to traumatic situations and people experiencing homelessness and mental health crises. The training provides additional skills in social and in racial justice. We are extremely proud of what we have accomplished throughout the year. We have also enjoyed the ability to once again bring together partner agencies to report out progress towards reducing crime on the public transit system, encouraging our neighboring cities and counties to rejoin the partnership and to set goals for the future. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your time today, and I will turn it back over to the other chair. Thank you, James, and thank you, executive team. I appreciate everyone walking us through the great work of MCSO. These remain uh, important topics of conversation, which we will continue to carry forward into the next fiscal year. We're going to begin the final portion of our budget presentation today, highlighting our proposed budget's new one-time only and restored programs. Next slide, please. We appreciate the support for many expanded resources in the proposed budget this year. MCSO has had consistent and revolving staffing shortages that have been severely impacted by the pandemic and retirements, and our human resources team is under-resourced to meet the demands of our large organization. Additionally, continued high vacancy rates can also have long-term bargaining implications and costs for labor contracts. This offer includes expanded recruitment strategies to attract a more diversified candidate base that reflects our community and begins to close our hiring gap. This also budgets the College to County program to expose participants from diverse backgrounds to MCSO careers, which is in alignment with the Workforce Equity Strategic Plan. A comprehensive training program aligned with agency and community values sets the stage for a progressive, evolving organization to best serve the needs of our community. With the proposed training expansion, which you heard about earlier, we will continue to support sworn employee responsibilities and meet state requirements while also developing new, more robust, trauma-informed and culturally responsive core competencies and explore more external training partnerships with enhanced subject matter expertise. We will also prioritize career development opportunities for our non-sworn professional staff through training focusing on leadership and equity, uh, diversity and inclusion. This year's proposed budget also supports operations specifically in corrections, including positions at MCDC Booking and Release MCIJ East Control, as well as enhancements in our Corrections Programs Unit. Another area to highlight is the Southeast Works Program Coordinator position. This offer provides funding to Southeast Works to support a Program Coordinator's direct partnership with MCSO for more inclusive reentry connections to our community specific to employment. 
Lastly is the updating of MCSO police radios. Communication between neighboring public safety agencies is vital to timely emergency response and coordination to address calls for service. This is necessary to support officer safety and provide equipment to staff that remains compatible to communicate with all of our surrounding agencies. Next slide, please. I would also like to note a couple of significant program changes. Listed here are two reductions to include facility security officers previously assigned to the Central Library and school resource deputies previously assigned to the Reynolds School District. In reconsidering the most appropriate response to security incidents at the Central Library, a non-uniform security option was determined a better alternative than the uniformed presence of the facility security officers. With respect to school resource deputies, the Reynolds School District conducted community member surveys to obtain feedback on continuing to have school resource deputies assigned to the schools. Uh, schools transitioned to remote learning and our contract for services expired. We are currently in the early stages of negotiations with the school district and their board to create a renewed model of service that reflects the community's needs. Also, as previously noted by the sheriff, MCSO's Justice Services Special Ops Fund was reduced by $775,000 as a result of the Metro contract expiring. This contract included funding connected to law enforcement and corrections. With that, thank you, and I will now turn it back over to the sheriff. Next slide, please. We're almost done. <laughs> I know it's your last one. You're trying to drag it out. I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to make you suffer. <laughs> Kidding. Kidding. It's a joke. A bad joke. Uh, each year, as MCSO operations comply with new laws and court rulings, we appreciate the opportunity to work uh, with our local public safety coordinating uh, council. I happened to see Abby this morning in the elevator for the first time in months in person. So I see her virtually all the time, but I wanted to uh, just say thank you to her and the Lipsick staff for their great work and partnership with us. Uh, the legislative session each year um, includes key bills aimed at addressing reform and accountability within public safety. Uh, we're poised to create new policy or a, adapt existing policy to ensure that we're following state law, which uh, so we talked earlier about that policy advisor uh, position that is critical to our success there. Uh, this year we had uh, Oregon State hospital fines and in response to the hospital's delay in transferring patients into their care, a Multnomah County judge found OHS, OSH in contempt and set fines uh, per day for those individuals in custody until their transfer. Uh, the order set out the obligation that they'll make those deposits to a trust fund with the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office to exclusively fund uh, staff training in, uh, in our correction staff on managing the behavioral health issues of people in custody in Multnomah County jails. I wanted to thank Judge Waller for that innovation. Uh, this year, a state reduction in start court funding includes a small reduction in funds at MCSO as well. And finally, our TriMet Transit Police Crisis Services model added funding for the program specialist senior position with the health department. And this collaboration between the MCSO, TriMet, and the health department, I think is really unique and speaks to uh, the innovation that happens within Multnomah County. Can we go to the next slide, please? I wanna to just touch briefly on COVID-19 and ARPA funds. Uh, the impacts on COVID-19 on all of us have been devastating and far reaching. Uh, first and foremost, at the sheriff's office, we have been focused on the safety and well being of our members, our community, including the adults in our custody. As previously stated by Chief Deputy Alexander, our corrections division has been hardest hit with respect to daily operations impacted by COVID 19. And I want to give a shout out to Dr. Jennifer Vines, Dr. Paul Lewis, Dr. Mike Seal, and Corrections Health Director Mike Obiero, and their staff for guiding us through the pandemic. Many jail and prison systems lost lives during the pandemic. Uh, to uh, COVID-19, and remar remarkably, MCSO did not. We had outbreaks, but we managed through them in partnership with public health, corrections health, and our leadership team. There were lessons learned in the last two years that increased our flexibility and opportunities. We moved with agility to create housing units that separated people safely, and teleworking is a new option for public safety professionals at MCSO. 
Next slide, please. So uh, I wanted to um, highlight and share my gratitude for the continued opportunity to ask for federal dollars to assist with the ongoing management of COVID-19. Uh, MCSO has requested funding to address civil, several impacts to our corrections division. Mitigating the risk of transmission of COVID-19 continues to be especially tra uh, challenging in congregate settings. Uh, IJ, uh, our Inverness jail facility, is comprised of primarily open dorm uh, style housing to include units with over 50 corrections beds. One primary opportunity for reducing risk of spreading the virus is to create physical distancing. By maintaining the current footprint of the jail, we're able to then lower the capacity in each of the dorms with the number of adults in custody, allowing for maximized space. Funding for the operation of those additional housing units, dorm five and dorm 13, allows for that increased physical distancing. As Steve mentioned earlier, electronic signage is critical to help provide timely health information to the adults in custody on COVID-19 and vaccine information. Uh, it also provides them with specific messaging and updates from our corrections facilities and our other partners. And then uh, one of the things on there again is our washing machine. Um, it'll help replace a, a critical piece of infrastructure that has helped uh, support our operations during the pandemic. When we have more frequent clothing washing as well as masking and other things that have happened. Next slide, please. In closing, I want to reiterate what I've said before. Public safety matters at its most fundamental level. Safety and security is our most basic need and that when met creates healthy and thriving communities. The protection of this community requires dedicated professionals willing to risk their personal safety in service to all of us. This past year, we celebrated multiple members who reached milestones within their careers. Shown here, these proud MCSO members represent a combined 129 years of service in corrections. I wanna thank Deputy Cross, Sergeant French, and Lieutenant Poole for all they have done to protect and serve. Corrections Lieutenant Vera Poole celebrated 50 years to, of service to Multnomah County. Uh, Vera currently holds the longest active certification across all Oregon Department of Public Safety standards and training disciplines to include policing, corrections, parole and probation. Uh, Vera says that corrections has been a rewarding career and that the, longe and the key to longevity in this career is to stay positive, which she certainly does. That smile is infectious and you see it every day on her face. I want to thank her for her dedication and leadership. She was honored at our Oregon State uh, Sheriff's Association conference this year for her incredible service to our community. I appreciate your support uh, for the work we do. I've uh, spent over 32 years in public safety service, and um, this board has been incredible to work with. Uh, Chair Kafori, thank you for your leadership and support. I want to thank our executive team. This is the best team I've ever had the opportunity to work with. The staff that do this work every year, particularly in the last two years, uh, have been inspiring to me, courageous in their response to the pandemic and the call for reform in our criminal justice system. So thank you. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thanks all of you. Very thorough this morning. Um, we are do have a 1230 stop. So if people have questions that go beyond that time, um, will take us beyond that time. We can schedule another. Um, go ahead, Commissioner Murray. Thank you. Um, so I won't take the whole time thanking you, Sheriff, um, for all of your work. Um, there, hopefully, there will be time to do that. But it, you know, just have appreciated you throughout the years and your focus on innovating and a holistic view toward um, criminal justice, law enforcement, public safety. So thank you so much. Uh, and um, I'm. I'm all these notes now I can't find them um but I also want to say thank you to Dwight also for all that you do in so many different arena arenas and um appreciate your service in this context on the CBAC and all the members of the CBAC as well and um I appreciated you did a really great job of articulating uh 
not just sort of program offers, what you would support, don't support, but some of those tensions that exist about how it all fits together, what the role of the CBAC is, what, how that plays into, you know, policy conversations, deeper conversations. And um, I think about those things a lot and appreciate your, your bringing those up in such a articulate way. And, um, and also I'll, all of the rest of you who have spoken, um, it's great to hear from you. Uh, the things that I want to just touch on are, um, you know, just noting those person, the striking personnel trends and, you know, needing to address that um, very head on and intentionally with a proactive approach that we can sustain over time. Um, the services, Chad, where, um, the services aspect of what um, what is intended within the sheriff's office, it's, I love it so much. And it really struck me just when we did our visit to uh, the, the jails uh, last month, whenever, um, it struck me then, it strikes me now, and I'm very excited uh, to learn more, see how this plays out, think about all the intersections and um, and also just appreciate, yeah, appreciate this work so much. And um, and then uh, James, I, I want to call out once again, and I mentioned during the, I think it was, was it DCJ or LIPS, one of the, the HOPE team, and it was DCJ, the incredible work there. And I had the, um, the privilege of going out with the team and doing some rounds with them. And I could not be more supportive of investments in that area. Um, the relationships you are, I mean, you are walking the walk. I mean, it's going out, it's establishing the relationships, it's getting to understand needs. So then you could provide those needs and those connections. And um, one thing when I was talking to Hope team members, when I was out there, really elevating the fact that the people who are houseless in our community, um, there's always, you know, you always read about criminalization of people who are homeless, but they are much more often the victims of crimes and they are some of the most, if not the most marginalized, vulnerable, um, disenfranchised people in our community. And what you're doing is building a relationship where they can believe that they can trust law enforcement, that they have the ability to be safe, the, the right to be safe as well. And that is just so huge and really look forward to kind of how that plays out. Um, I, um, I do have some questions about body worn cameras and we, you know, it's going to be a thing. So I will ask those later, but they will, um, you know, I want to have some more conversation about that. And um, and also, again, probably a broader conversation, but use of ARPA funds for the um, for jail dorms and and um, what we're anticipating in terms of COVID moving forward. So a lot of that. And I actually really support the, the wellness coordinator position. I just want to mention that up front because I've spoken with a number of uh, deputies and um, and and with Matt Ingram and. It really makes so much sense. We cannot do our work. Any anyone who does frontline work, especially work that's as stressful and challenging as work um, in corrections and law enforcement, without being supported. And um, and so, I I just support that. Anyway, that's it from me. Thank you. Can I try it, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, Chair Fries and everyone else. Uh, I too assume that we will have lots of opportunities to thank you, Chair Fries, for your service <laughs> and to to wish you happy sailing um, on your next adventure. Uh, so uh, for now, just a couple of comments on the budget. I, I do have some questions, so I look forward to a follow-up session, but just a few things I wanted to call out that I really appreciate in this budget. Um, I do appreciate that wellness super, uh, coordinator position, you know, I think ensuring the wellness of our of our um, MCSO staff uh, is important for them and it's important for 
the the services that we provide to our adults in custody as well. So I think that's really important. I want to support the the addition of paying for the phone calls for adults in custody. Um, that's that's a, sort of a kind of a fundamental um, service that I, I think they're entitled to, and that um, I'm glad to see us providing. And then also the Southeast Works position that inReach is so so important. I think Southeast Works does does good work. Um, so very supportive of that, and also the Women First program that was mentioned. And then finally on the ARP investments, um, the the two positions or the positions related to firearms. You know, uh, Sheriff Reese, you and I talked about this. We the the causes root causes of violence are really complicated, but what's not complicated is recognizing that when there's a firearm involved, the risk of lethality is so much greater. And so all of the really, really good work that you're doing to make to, to remove the guns from the streets, um, very supportive of those investments. I do have questions about body-worn camera program. Um, I have some questions about Close Street and um, so about the, the ARP investments in the jail dorm. So I look forward to asking those at the next opportunity. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Sheriff Reese, and everyone for presenting today. Uh, and Dwight, uh, thank you uh, for your service and uh, the entire CBAC. Uh, so, Sheriff, I have to. I tell the story about you all the time. Uh, I do think it's important to to recognize your service and how much I've appreciated uh, your partnership, especially in East County. But when we had a Black Lives Matter rally in Troutdale, uh, Sheriff Reese not only said that he would come, he came. He shut down 257. And he walked with us into Troutdale. And I think that is just exemplary of, of how you work and care about our community. Uh, so I just want to thank you. Uh, you. You really care so much, so deeply, uh, and you demonstrate that, not only in your uh, words, but in your deeds. So thank you. Um, just a, a, a couple of comments. Uh, I do, you know, I, I saw the the stats on the dispossession of guns, and so this could be a longer term question about. Uh, I'm wondering about, you know, when we fund uh, more dispossession and what that arc or what, you know, like if we invest more money, can how much, how many more guns can we get off the street? Uh, so maybe we could talk a little bit further about that. Uh, I really love the Southeast Works and, of course, the Women First about really connecting people to jobs and services. And uh, just really, you know, the HOPE team, you know, that's been a labor of love for all of us. And, you know, I think some people would argue, and I get it, uh, that maybe law enforcement isn't the first agency that you want to see uh, involved uh, with the houseless community. But I really don't see how you all can avoid uh, from interacting with those folks. And I think it's important to have uh, law enforcement that has a deep understanding of the needs and the services and the lives and the challenges that, that those folks have and the HOPE team does. So I would argue that it is important for you to have that training and for the HOPE team uh, to be in existence. Uh, and then with the peer support, that's amazing. So I'm super excited about that and the clinician. And uh, finally, I would just add Lieutenant Poole. Oh my gosh, what, what a rock star. Uh, and all of, I mean, what'd you say, 150 years? I don't know, <laughs> in, in experience. But again, this work is so hard that I don't, I have no idea how hard it is, but certainly from the outside, I know it's hard. Uh, and for someone, and for you know the many people that are like 20, 25, 30 years, uh, how you do this, day, this work day in and day out, I have no idea, but I'm extremely grateful. So thank you all for being here today. So um, <clears throat> just want to remind commissioners um, to send your questions to Christian so that we can gather them and try to prepare the next um, the follow up budget briefing, which will be sometime in June. So we'll be in touch with you about that. But thank you all. Thank you for bringing your whole team today. Thank you. Um, and that concludes our time today. Uh, we will be back. Tomorrow, um, 6 p.m. is our first public hearing, so it's virtual. Um, if folks want more information about the public hearing, they can go on the Multnomah County website and find out all they need to know about how to participate. So we'll see some of you tomorrow night at 6 o'clock.
Others we will see on Thursday morning at 930 for our regular board briefing, board meeting. And until then, happy election day. If you haven't voted yet, it is not too late to turn your ballots. They just have to be postmarked by 8 o'clock tonight. That's the new state law. So don't forget to vote. Thanks.